You hear the echo of a gunshot. People all around you begin to scream in panic. You run and dive for cover. As you breathe heavily trying to get your bearings, you look down. You've been hit. A pool of blood begins to soak through your shirt. How does getting shot feel? Let's find out. We've all seen someone get shot in the movies or television shows, but do these depictions have it right? According to the CDC, in 2017, around 40,000 people died from gun-related deaths in the United States alone. However, many people also survive being shot, and when they tell their story and what it feels like, there are several commonalities. That being said, everyone is different. Some people have really high tolerances for pain, while others not so much. The sensations felt from being shot are most certainly connected to the location of the bullet wound, the size of the bullet, and the person themselves. But let's look at different accounts and see what most have in common. Many gunshot survivors remember the initial penetration of the bullet. The strange thing is, they don't remember feeling any pain at first. This is surprising, since you think a searing hot chunk of metal ripping through your skin, muscle, and nerves would be excruciating. However, for the most part, survivors of gun wounds tend not to notice they've been shot until they see blood. One gunshot survivor remembers the impact of the bullet feeling like someone had thrown a small pebble at her. The bullet hit her in the side, and all she remembers was being in shock, but not feeling any initial pain. This may be surprising at first, but this is not uncommon with people who have been shot. Many people recount that within the first few moments of being hit by a bullet, they didn't feel anything at all. Once the brain realizes that the body's been injured and it could be life-threatening, it goes into survival mode. The brain dumps adrenaline into the bloodstream, which causes the body to increase blood pressure and heart rate, expand air passages to the lungs, and maximize energy output. This allows the body to reach superhuman levels and maintain homeostasis even under intense circumstances. The body obviously can't keep this heightened energy level up forever, but it does allow the body to continue functioning even if it's been mortally wounded. The lack of pain is also connected to the size of the bullet. Larger bullets create larger holes and tend to inflict more pain. However, you'd think a smaller caliber should still cause severe pain, but the body's able to do amazing things under life or death circumstances. A smaller bullet, such as a 9mm that doesn't break apart on entry, will cause a lot less pain than a large bullet that tears apart into shrapnel. Bullets that break apart within the body can rip through surrounding tissue and muscle around the initial entry point. This causes widespread damage and pain in the affected area. The more damage caused, the more pain signals will be sent to the brain, the more excruciating the injury will be. Once the initial shock starts to wear off, the body begins damage control. Many gunshot victims remember feeling a burning sensation. This is pretty universal among survivors. Some people describe the burning sensation as feeling sort of like an intense bee sting. However, the initial burning does not decrease, just intensifies, so it feels like being stung by a bee with a never-ending stinger, like a needle just continuously being pushed into your body. The burning sensation seems to start the same. When the bullet penetrates the skin, the person feels an impact, but the burn doesn't start immediately. In fact, many gunshot survivors remember feeling numb. As the bullet enters their body, they can feel pressure, but it doesn't hurt. Then, a numbness sweeps across their entire body, radiating from the point that the bullet entered from. As the numbness and shock begin to fade, it's replaced by the burning sensation. Other than feeling like a never-ending bee sting, some people have described the burning sensation as being incredibly hot, like someone was sticking an iron poker that had just come out of a fire into their body. Other gunshot survivors explain that the burning sensation feels like someone is jamming their finger into a raw blister. The burning has also been described as an incredibly intense sunburn that's concentrated on a single point of the body, or like someone is is taking a bunch of needles and just sticking them into them, except it's as if each time the needle enters the body, it's just continuously being pushed further and further in, with no end to the sensation. The burning seems to begin at the point of entry, but then radiates outward. This may be a small piece of shrapnel ripping through the nerves, but one thing is clear. For most people who have been shot, the burning sensation is what is felt after the brain becomes aware that the bullet has entered the body. Again, every person's body is different and therefore will react in different ways to intense trauma like being shot. Soldiers that have been shot have recounted that they've had a very different experience from a bullet ripping through them. Most agree that when the bullet enters the body, there is an initial period of no pain at all, but that doesn't last long. Instead of a slow burning, the bullet wound goes from a slight pressure to excruciating pain. The reason that soldiers may experience a more intense pain is because they most likely have been shot by a higher caliber bullet from a rifle. The ammunition and guns used in military warfare are probably not the same weapons that civilians are shot by during senseless acts of gun violence. This is not always true, but it would seem that being shot by an assault rifle versus a pistol with a small caliber bullet would correlate to a more intense pain. One soldier who was shot says the initial shock wore off after a few seconds of a bullet entering his stomach. Then the pain immediately began. He remembers it feeling like being hit by a sledgehammer in the stomach over and over, resulting in the worst incontinence possible. However, with his intense pain, he saw that a warm numbness flowed through the rest of his body and eventually he blacked out. On the other end of the spectrum, some people who have been shot say there was no pain at all. They didn't feel a burning sensation. They didn't feel like they'd been ripped open. They felt 
nothing. This could just be based on the person, but there are actually a few accounts of people being shot and saying they didn't feel much pain. One man who was shot in the calf by a 22 caliber bullet said it didn't hurt. He chalks this up to the bullet being small. It also probably had to do with where he got shot, as there are no vital organs in the calf. Being shot in different areas of the body seemed to account for different sensations. But what about being shot in the head? You may be surprised to find that surviving a gunshot wound to the head is not as uncommon as you might think. You might also expect that being shot in the head would be excruciating, but this isn't necessarily the case either. One man was accidentally shot in the head by his wife while he slept. Now, accidentally shooting someone in the head seems unlikely, but that is the story the wife stuck to. Either way, while her husband slept, the gun went off and the bullet ripped through his skull. When the man awoke, he didn't even know he'd been shot. Instead, he complained to his wife of a massive headache. The headache was so bad, the man asked his wife to drive him to the hospital, which she did. According to the victim, it wasn't until the nurse at the hospital informed him that he had been shot in the head that he realized what had happened. At this point, the wife ran out of the hospital to avoid being charged with attempted murder. However, this is not the only account of someone being shot in the head and surviving. There are a few commonalities between survivors of gunshot wounds to the head. The first is the intense headache that accompanies the bullet penetrating the skull. This is not surprising, as they now have a piece of metal lodged in their brain. The other commonality is a ringing sound. Most people who have been shot in the head and survive say they hear a constant ringing in their ears. Some describe the ringing as a unique sound unlike anything they'd ever heard before. It's so intense and loud it drowns out almost all other noise. Other survivors describe it as a really loud buzzing, like having bees inside your ears. And yet others describe it like the ringing of a bell in your head. Regardless of the description of the ringing, everyone agrees that it is incredibly loud and persistent. There also seems to be an initial ping sound from being shot in the head. The ping then starts to intensify into the ringing, which lasts anywhere from hours to days or weeks later. The ringing isn't painful per se, it's just really loud and annoying. Most gunshot survivors say the most painful part of being shot is the recovery process. The initial gunshot wound for many seems to be a burning sensation, but that's nothing compared to what happens if they survive the gunshot. Their rush to surgery and depending on where the bullet entered, the operation to remove the bullet and mend the wound is excruciating. Many gunshot survivors say that the recovery and rehab process after being shot is much worse than the getting shot itself. One survivor even described how when she was operated on, the doctors couldn't find the bullet initially and they didn't want to go digging around in her body looking for it, so they decided to leave the bullet in. The survivor had to have multiple surgeries in order to recover from the gunshot, and during one of them, the bullet had actually been pushed close to the surface of the skin. She remembered the bullet was practically poking out of her body until she convinced one of the surgeons to remove it. Many gunshot wounds take months to heal. This means that for a long period of time, survivors are in constant pain from their body healing. And yet, the pain of recovery isn't even the worst part for many gunshot survivors. It's the psychological trauma that haunts them for the rest of their lives that causes the most pain. Most people who are shot end up with PTSD. They're typically sent to counselors and therapists to help them work through the traumatic experience. But this does not always help. Being shot does not mean they're afraid of being around guns or loud noises, but even things that are unrelated to being shot might set off a sense of fear and terror. For many, with the help of medical professionals and counselors, the PTSD can go away, but for some it doesn't, and they have to live the rest of their lives with the disorder. Getting shot is never pleasant. Whether it's a burning sensation, intense pain, or psychological trauma, it is something that stays with you for the rest of your life. The sensations associated with being shot depend on the person, the type of bullet, and where the bullet entered. Many people who survive being shot never fully recover. We've all seen the Hollywood movies where the good guy has an epic shootout with a thousand bad guys, and after gunning them all down, the lead bad guy fires off one bullet and hits our hero in the shoulder, or maybe the leg somewhere painful, but you know, not lethal. Then the bad guy goes down in a hail of gunfire, as the hero wins the day through superior firepower. What's not shown in these Hollywood movies though, is just how dangerous it is to get shot. Yes, even a quote flesh wound, end quote. Today though, we're going to explore what happens to your body when you get shot, and how to survive a gunshot wound. Obviously, no one thinks a gunshot wound to the head is a great idea, but surely getting shot in the shoulder or the leg will make you look pretty heroic and maybe hurt real bad, but not be life-threatening? Sadly, it's time to toss all of those myths out the window, because yes, even a shot to the shoulder, and especially the leg, can be fatal. Bullets travel fast. That's why Superman is famously portrayed as faster than a speeding bullet. What you may not realize though is just how fast they travel. A 9mm bullet of the same caliber used by most police officers travels at a whopping 900 miles an hour, while a 5.56 round of the same type used by American combat carbines typically travels at around 2,045 miles per hour. 
a 7.62mm round of the same type used by heavy American machine guns and the AK family of Russian combat rifles travels on average at about 1,841 miles per hour. Those incredible speeds means that they contain an incredible amount of kinetic energy. Bullets, however, are very small things. Most are under an inch. But what they lack in mass, they more than make up for in acceleration. And remember that in Newton's second law of motion, the relationship between speed and kinetic energy is not additive, it's quadratic. With such incredible velocities, even small rounds can deliver a truly terrifying amount of energy. Take for example the humble 9mm bullet. Even with its small size, it can still deliver on average 542 joules of energy, while the 5.56mm round packs around 1,763 joules, and the 7.62 round around 3,525 joules. When a bullet enters the body, all of that energy it's carrying has to go somewhere, and that's going to be your soft, fleshy body tissues. As the bullet enters, the shockwave of impact causes your flesh to expand and creates a large cavity, which then very quickly falls back in on itself. This huge shock through your body's tissues can severely damage internal organs, even if the bullet didn't actually pierce any of them. Next is damage that the bullets cause once they're inside your body. In the movies, the good guy gets shot in the arm or the leg and the bullet is fished out and the wound cauterized and bam! Just like that, the hero is ready to go back to chewing bubblegum and kicking ass. In real life, things tend to get messy. Especially if the bullet's final stop is somewhere nice and bony, like a shoulder. That's because bullets are very prone to fragmenting once hitting something solid like bone, due to their incredible velocities, and the fact that bullets tend to be made up of layers of different materials. Striking a bone, or sometimes even just the extreme stresses of rapid deceleration inside the human body, can be enough to fragment a bullet into many pieces, and this can make things really messy. Fragments of a bullet will explode outwards in different directions, causing even more damage to surrounding tissues and organs. Bullets that retain most of their mass are even prone to bouncing around inside the body cavity if they happen to strike bone. And needless to say, having a piece of very sharp, deformed metal bouncing around inside of you like a pinball machine is not great for your health. The body is notoriously allergic to being shot at, and it tends to react to bullet wounds by trying to pump as much of the blood you have inside of you into your immediate vicinity. This rapid and extreme blood loss is what makes bullets so potentially fatal, as even severe organs and tissue damage can be repaired or survived given a fast enough medical response. With all of your red, red crewy leaking out of you at an alarming rate though, death is just minutes or even seconds away. Top scientists have labored for decades and have at last determined that the best way to survive getting shot at is to try to keep as much of your blood inside your body where it belongs. So our survival tip number one for surviving a gunshot wound is to apply immediate pressure to the wound site. You want to try and wrap bandages of some sort, even dirty t-shirts would do, around the wound itself and maintain constant pressure in order to slow the blood loss. If shot on a limb, elevate it above the heart to minimize blood loss and keep the pressure on. You should very quickly be on your way to the hospital, but if you happen to be on a solo Rambo-esque mission in the middle of the jungle against evil drug lords, then the important thing is to maintain pressure and never ever remove the bandage, no matter how bloody they get. Removing a bandage on a wound can actually tear open the wound again after your body has worked very hard to seal it up through coagulation. Of course, you could try the popular Hollywood method of cauterization, which is a very good way of stopping blood flow if you know what you're doing. Only certain types of wounds can be successfully cauterized without submitting large parts of your body to terrible third-degree burns. And even worse, without very prompt medical attention, those third-degree burns could pose an even greater risk of deadly infection than your single bullet wound. If blood loss can't be stopped or slowed down significantly and the wound is on a limb, it's time to take drastic measures. You're going to want to get your hands on a stick and tear up your shirt into a long strip. Tie the shirt above the wound but before the torso and then wrap the ends of the shirt around the stick and start turning the stick in circles like a crank. This will tighten the shirt around your limb to painful levels, but you need to keep going. You need to tighten your makeshift bandage so tight that it cuts off all blood flow to your wound. And yes, this does mean that if you don't get very prompt medical attention, you will end up losing the limb. Without blood flow, the limb's tissues will die off, but your life will be saved by preventing you from bleeding out. Tourniquets, as these makeshift devices are known, can be lifesavers and are a last-ditch measure to save someone's life. 
In the end, the best way to survive a gunshot wound is to not get shot in the first place. But if you do get shot, you need to remember to keep constant pressure on the wound and as a last resort, create a makeshift tourniquet and tie off the affected limb. Better to lose an arm or a leg than to bleed out and die. With modern medicine, even the most grievous gunshot wounds can be very survivable, and doctors often talk about the golden hour, where if a trauma victim can be on a surgical table within an hour, that person's life can likely be saved. The Amazon River, 4,300 miles in length, running through Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. It's the second longest river in the world, between the Nile in Egypt and the Yangtze in China. It's a rich ecosystem supporting life throughout the Amazon rainforest. While many animals call this place home if you're a human being and you're not prepared, this natural wonder of the world can quickly become a watery grave. Sadly, thanks to crime, dangerous wildlife, and unpreparedness, there are many stories of people visiting the Amazon River and never coming back. When you think of scary things in or near the Amazon River, most people think of things like the green anaconda, the largest snake in the world, capable of swallowing pigs, jaguars, or even humans, or the Amazonian bull shark, a huge 11-foot shark that will eat pretty much anything, including human beings and its own species, or the menacing electric eel that can deliver a lethal shock even eight hours after its death or even the bloodthirsty red-bellied piranha, known for being able to swim and pick even large prey completely clean of all flesh. And let's not even get into the nightmares of the giant tarantulas and centipedes. However, the two real threats to western kayakers visiting the Amazon River are the treacherous whitewater rapids of the river itself and the brutal pirates whom roam the rivers. That's right, pirates. But we're talking less spyglasses and cutlasses and more speedboats and AK-47s. Because the Amazon River's human population has experienced a boom in the past few decades and a successful drug trade has unfolded down the river, piracy has sadly flourished. Heavily armed groups of well-organized criminals have been able to commit robbery, rape, and murder along the river with abandon. If you run into those pirates and you follow all their orders and give them your belongings, they may still shoot you just to tie up a loose end. If you don't follow their orders, unless you've got a lot of skill and an inhuman amount of luck on your side, you're pretty much doomed. People have been shot, beaten to death, stabbed, strangled, and dismembered. These pirates aren't in the habit of leaving survivors, as their seafaring predecessors always used to say, dead men tell no tales. That brings us to South African modern-day explorer Davy Duplessis an inspirational exception to this rule. In this mind-blowing episode of the Infographic Show, we're going to tell you Davy's remarkable story of Amazon survival. It's the story about how a distraught mother, some benevolent locals, Facebook, a beer company, and one truly stubborn man can sometimes deliver a miracle. Even before his 2012 incident in the Amazon, Davy Duplessis had always been an adventurer. The year prior, he'd cycled 9,000 miles down the east coast of Africa, from Cairo in Egypt to Belito in South Africa, over the course of 120 days. Plessy, a humanitarian at heart, devoted this feat of human endurance to Habitat for Humanity. The sponsorship dues from the project raised enough funds to create a house for an underprivileged family in Tanzania. For most people, this would be enough of a lifetime achievement to take it easy from then on, but in many respects, Davy Duplessis is not most people. He immediately began planning his 2012 mission, Project Amazon. According to Davy's personal website, it was intended to be an unsupported solo mission down the Amazon River, traveling over 6,700 miles over the course of five months. Davy would begin at the river's source, way up in the Peruvian Andes, and would terminate at the river's mouth, Brazil's coastline to the Atlantic Ocean. Davy planned on achieving this route with a combination of paddling, cycling, and hiking. Much like his trip across Africa, Davy's new expedition was all about making a statement. This time, he wanted to promote conservation and environmentally conscious living. He also teamed up with the group Adventurers and Scientists for Conservation, with whom he intended to provide the data he collected along the way. Davy wasn't naive either. He was prepared for many of the potential threats that he could face in the Amazon. When talking about planning for the experience, he said, In Africa, the fears were the big game. The Amazon is a very different environment. The fears came from the small creatures. Davy took extra precautions against poison arrow frogs, bullet ants, and the kanjiru, the Amazon River's infamous and supposedly urethra-invading fish. In theory, he'd accounted for almost everything. He even said that in the river itself, he made a firm commitment to not go any deeper than his knees. This was a project that started out with the purest of intentions. He was self-sufficient, cooking his own meals and purifying rainwater to drink. 
Davy would paddle for solid blocks of 10 to 12 hours a day, even sleeping in his kayak and allowing the river's current to keep him moving toward his destination. At night, he'd establish base camps on the river's edge and sleep before getting back up and doing it all again the next day. He had a close call two weeks into his journey. While washing a pot on the river's edge in complete jungle darkness, he felt something slither around his leg. He would later find out that this was a baby anaconda and remarked that it was perhaps the first time the snake had ever seen a human being before. As a hardcore animal lover, Davy took it in stride. An animal he encountered frequently was the Amazonian freshwater river dolphin. Pods of these dolphins often trailed his kayak during his morning rowing for a couple miles. In August, one of these dolphins even attempted to breach the bottom of his kayak. This, Davy figured, was likely because a young male dolphin during mating season had mistaken his kayak for an eligible bachelorette. He had pleasant encounters with local tribesmen, many of whom had never met people from outside the country, but were genial and welcoming nonetheless. Two months had passed, and it seemed that everything was going according to plan. However, 56 days into Davy's trip, disaster struck. Two men in a dugout motorboat passed his kayak. Davy brushed it off at first, as the boat pulled ahead and disappeared in front of him. After all, plenty of locals worked the river. Davy just carried on rowing. Ten minutes later, Davy felt a sudden, intense impact on his back, a sensation he described as being like a baseball bat slamming into you. He fell from his boat and began to sink. Davy had been shot, and worse, the bullet had struck him in the spine, leaving him partially paralyzed from the waist up. Inside his head, he was screaming at himself, swim, move, but he just kept sinking into the murky depths of the river. When he hit the bottom, he finally regained some movement in his lower body and managed to surface, disoriented and afraid. He looked around seeing nothing but his upturned kayak. As he pushed himself back toward the boat, a second bullet blasted into the left side of Davy's face. He managed to drag himself to the riverbank about 15 feet away and collapsed on the water's edge. But Davy's ordeal was far from over. He felt another impact, this time on the right side of his face. He'd been shot, again, puncturing his carotid artery and spilling copious amounts of blood out into the river below him. It was in this moment that he truly realized how isolated he was here and that the people closest to him did not have his best interests at heart. In this moment of pain and fear, he said to himself, this is it, this is where you die. But against all odds, he was wrong. The motorboat he saw earlier sped toward him, containing only one of the men he'd seen earlier. Davy deduced that the other one had just been shooting him. He rose shakily to his feet and begged the second man for his life. The man, an Amazon pirate, was utterly indifferent. He approached Davy, preparing to finish him off manually. But Davy ran, powered by pure adrenaline, into the jungle. The second unseen pirate fired off a fourth shot and struck Davy in the leg as he fled. But Davy kept running. He ran for a solid couple miles, escaping the two pirates. But suddenly realizing he was injured, without supplies and utterly alone, he collapsed, once again figuring he was doomed. He'd been shot twice in the face, once in the torso and once in the leg. For a couple minutes, he almost accepted it and let himself slip away. Suddenly, he found himself surging with a second burst of power. In this moment, Davy decided that he had two choices, to lay down and die or to get up and live. If he was going to survive this horrible incident, it would be all about choosing to live. He kept going for another mile and a half until he got tremendously lucky. He came upon two tribesmen at the riverbank and managed to get their attention. They quickly attended to him and brought him back to their community for treatment. The tribe began making arrangements to have him transported to a hospital in the city of Pucaipa, Peru. But this hospital was 24 hours away and the tribe didn't have the fuel to get him there. However, they swaddled him with blankets and resolved to take him to the next tribe a few hours downriver. They could help transport him on the next leg of his emergency journey. For a torturous three hours, Davy waited in the bed of the boat, too weak to move, while the two tribes brokered the deal. They needed money to get him to the hospital, but Davy didn't have any, on account of just being robbed by bloodthirsty pirates. Things were getting worse, Davy's organs were beginning to inflate, and he started to vomit blood. His internal bleeding was so bad that he occasionally began to choke on the coagulated blood clots making their way up his throat. At this point, the boatmen of the new tribe realized any payment could wait until later, and they began rushing Davy downriver. The hospital was still 20 hours away. However, these boatmen wouldn't be the last in the massive intercommunal act of collaboration that saved Davy's life. He was dropped off twice more, in the middle of the forest, 
where two more communities came and took him through the next portion of the journey. Davey felt kind of like the baton at a relay race, but given the limited resources of these altruistic communities, it was his best chance of staying alive. It happened twice more before he reached the hospital in Pucapa where he had to endure another six hours of waiting in limbo while the doctors attempted to identify him. Davey called and spoke to his mother, who immediately took to Facebook, attempting to find a local Spanish speaker who might be able to help save her son's life. And amazingly, it worked. Two men walked into the hospital offering to help Davey after having heard his story from his mother's Facebook posts. Were these men doctors? Government officials? No, they were representatives of South African Breweries, or SAB, a beer company from Davey's home country. They immediately paid off the doctors who gave Davey an x-ray, which made them realize they didn't have the capacity to treat wounds this serious. He'd need to be flown to a hospital in Lima, Peru's capital. Once again, the SAB men came to the rescue. They booked him a spot on a commercial airline where he was loaded into a stretcher and tied across four streets, traumatizing surrounding commercial passengers. Eventually, he did reach the hospital in Lima and spent a month in the ICU. Davy was told he'd been shot four times with a 22 caliber shotgun and was immensely lucky to be alive. Buckshot had pierced his lungs, skull, windpipe, and heart. The final piece of Buckshot remains in his heart to this day, but he made a full recovery. It had taken the combined forces of six whole communities, one terrified mother, two beer company representatives, and doctors in two hospitals to undo the damage two armed men had done in minutes. But the result was successfully saving Davy Duplessis' life in a heartwarming example of how the compassion of many can truly make a difference. The incident hasn't scared Davy away from adventuring. He's performed subsequent missions in Botswana and continues to make a positive impact as an author, activist, and motivational speaker. There are certainly terrifying things hiding in the Amazon jungle, but Davy's story proves that there's great kindness and beauty in there too. The date is March 6, 1978, and one of America's most liked and despised men had just had lunch with his attorney and is heading back to the courthouse in Gwinnett County, Georgia to attend one of his many famous trials. Bullets start ringing out and both men drop to the ground after being hit. What they don't know is that the man who would later be dubbed the racist killer is making his getaway. One of the victims of the crime will have some scars, but the other will never walk again and live through periods of agonizing pain. And that's how it goes with bullets. Sometimes they cause little damage and sometimes they ruin a person forever. But before we get into the technical details about being shot, we guess you want to know who this man was who was both admired and utterly despised. His name was Larry Flint. We say was because he died in early 2021. Back in the day when this intrepid entrepreneur was shocking the US with his pornographic magazine Hustler, he wasn't exactly popular with a good part of the country. These folks didn't want what they called smut, damaging the minds and eyes of the youth after seeing that Flint had turned what was a small, naughty newsletter into a national sensation. As his magazines were selling in the millions, he ended up in court fighting for his First Amendment rights while using some very colorful language. Then one day, a madman and serial killer named Joseph Paul Franklin found one of Flint's magazines. This guy's racism was the reason he killed perhaps over 20 people, and it's also why he shot Flint and his attorney, something he wasn't charged with in the end, although he went down for the other murders. Many years after the shooting, he admitted he did it because he'd seen an interracial couple making out in one of the magazines, something he couldn't accept. Yep, Franklin was a big fan of Adolf Hitler's ideology. He later said this about what he saw in the magazine, it just made me sick. I threw the magazine down and thought, I'm gonna kill that guy. He picked up his Ruger 44 caliber semi-automatic rifle and went in search of the porn king. Franklin was executed for his crimes in 2013, at which point Mr. Flint was still getting around in a wheelchair. Flint's attorney, Gene Reeves Jr., was also seriously wounded, but after spending one month in hospital, he was good to go. That's because when his body was penetrated by cold, hard steel, by the whim of fate, he wasn't hit in such a way to cause lifelong injuries. As for Flint's injuries, it was revealed that the bullet had caused severe spinal cord damage. The New York Times at the time wrote in the first paragraph of a story that the chief neurosurgeon Dr. George Tyndall, who'd removed the bullet from Flint's back, said he he had a 50-50 chance of ever walking again. He told the press there were no reflexes in the lower extremities and there's a loss of sensation from his mid-thighs down. Things were bad, very bad. Flint would not walk again, and with him being notorious for his love of sex, he wasn't exactly over the moon about losing his ability to use his member. This was later rectified with the use of a penile implant. Still, that hardly put a silver lining on the darkest clouds that followed Flint around for the rest of his life. That bullet that had hit him in the spinal canal at a spot called the third lumbar vertebra. Back then, when such a thing happened, there was only a 50% chance that the damaged part would regenerate. Even now, if a bullet hits you down there, you might not ever walk again. At the time, the surgeon
surgeon also said there had been damage to the nerves at the end of the spinal column. That surgeon didn't know then that these nerve injuries would plague Flint for the rest of his life. Flint lived most of his life in almost constant pain, although many years later some of the nerves that were causing the anguish were removed. But before this, when he felt pain on an almost daily basis, it was so much that he ended up getting addicted to painkillers and booze. He later said that he didn't want Franklin executed, but oh god, he wished that man could experience the pain he had. We think this line of Flint about sums up how he felt. I would love an hour in a room with him and a pair of wire cutters and pliers, so I can inflict the same damage on him that he inflicted on me. So, we have constant debilitating pain, we have a man that can never walk again, and only with the help of modern science was he able to use his most treasured asset. Could things have been any worse? The answer is yes, because of all the drugs Flint was taking for the pain, he ended up having an overdose which brought on a stroke. After that, he had difficulty speaking. We're sure all the good Christians who hated him, while not very Buddhist, said this was a fitting kind of karma for releasing smut on America and talking filth at every opportunity. Flint was 78 when he died of heart failure. So, as being shot goes and living to tell the tale, getting whacked where Flint did in the back is about as bad as it gets. Or is it? Before we get to what's worse than that, first let's look at some numbers just to give you an idea of how many people get shot just in the USA. The Washington Post wrote in 2021 that even though the pandemic kept a lot of people off the streets in 2020, that year saw the worst rise in gun-related violence for a long time. Meanwhile, the CDC wrote that the increase in all homicides from 2019 to 2020 was the highest highest increase, 30%, since 1905. Pew Research cited some FBI data that said there were 21,570 homicides in 2020, up from 16,669 in 2019. The vast majority of those murders were committed with guns, usually handguns, and to a lesser extent rifles and shotguns. Pew said it's not clear why there was such a rise, but it took a stab at guessing that it was related to the hardships people had faced during the pandemic. Americans, it seems, don't often take a stab at things in the literal sense because guns are so widely available. If you look at a country such as the UK, a country with relatively few murders, since guns aren't easy to get, many of the homicides are committed with knives. Getting shot is worse, though, with one paper saying one-third of patients die with bullet wounds compared to the relatively smaller 7.7% fatality rate for stab wounds. So, now that those sobering facts have chilled your bones, let's talk about a kid that got shot in the head and survived. Yep, it happens. In this case, the event took place in 2021 in a place called Frogtown. From news reports, we can see that this 17-year-old was able to talk to cops after he was shot, but he was rushed to the hospital in a critical but stable condition. This means he was messed up, but his vital organs were all in order. Luckily, the bullet didn't penetrate his brain, or at least we can assume that from the news reports. If you get shot in the head, you're in for a rough ride, especially if the brain is hit. Many other headshots still hit the face or graze the head, and that could end up with a less serious injury. Statistics tell us 42% of people who get hit in the head survive, but it's a totally different matter when the bullet enters the brain. According to the Baltimore Sun, only 5% of people shot in the brain in the USA survive. Medical experts say that your chance of survival is much higher if you're shot directly in the front of the head. If the bullet penetrates the side, it's pretty much always game over. The reason is, a bullet hitting the front might just destroy part of one of the brain's hemispheres unless it goes right down the midline. In that case, as with getting hit in the side, the bullet might destroy both hemispheres and it ain't easy fighting another day after that. But if you do survive and only one side of the brain has been damaged, you can expect to live the rest of your life with a disability, since memory, cognition, and speech are controlled by both sides. A survivor could expect to have problems with those important facets, not to mention the physical disabilities, but we think you need some hard facts about bullets to the head, and thankfully, or unthankfully, they're not hard to find in the US. In one very American story reported in 2021, a couple of years ago, one kid got bullied by another kid, and so the bullied kid returned later and shot the other kid in the head. This happened in Minneapolis. The kid who did the shooting actually got shot himself later by a cop during a traffic stop involving an attempted arrest. The kid died, and the cop was charged with second-degree manslaughter. That other kid, he survived getting shot one time in the head, but was left permanently disabled. News reports now say he has permanent mental and physical disabilities and can't live his life without the constant care of a caretaker. In a lawsuit for the victim, it was claimed that he is now not able to handle his personal affairs or meet his basic living needs. It seems this kid can still do certain things, but if you do survive such a severe traumatic brain injury, there's a good chance you could get left in a permanent vegetative state. With that in mind, when you think about Larry Flint getting it on with his penile implant, especially after he had those troublesome nerves clipped, he came out alright next to most survivors who'd taken a bullet to the brain. 
Not that we want it to happen to someone, but we'd say it'd be better to get hit in the back than in the head. Even if the bullet makes contact with the worst spots, we reckon you have more of a chance of a better life taking one to the spine than you do to that beautiful organ in your head. And that's why we have thick skulls. Still, there's a lot of luck involved with getting shot. You can survive a headshot or a back shot and even live to smile about it, while a shot that penetrates the flap in your leg could mean lights out. That's because in your leg you have the femoral artery. It's easy to hit. Kids stab each other in the leg and think they won't hurt someone so much, but they end up doing time for murder. It's the same with the arm. If you hit the brachial artery, you can easily kill someone. A guy named Ed Sizemore, who works for the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center's Firearms Division, admitted that there are really bad places to get hit. But he also said this, people get shot in fatal areas and live, and others get shot in non-lethal areas and die. He said what we just said, that the brain is definitely the worst place to get shot. The heart, he said, can be fixed if a person gets help very fast, but with the brain it's not so easy to patch it up. Now we need to talk about pain. So far, we've discussed the worst places to get shot in terms of your chance of dying and what will likely happen even if you do survive, but we think we need to say something about the places you can get shot that will make you howl like a banshee. Bear in mind, many people have felt only a thud in their leg and bled to death without much pain at all. Many people have talked about online when they were shot and said they didn't feel much pain at all. Some have said they felt there was kind of a stabbing pain or like being hit by something or being stung, but they said the worst pain was when they went to the hospital and had their wounds tended to. It's not always like that, we assure you. Let's imagine for a moment you get shot in the foot, like Spider from the movie Goodfellas. That's going to sting a bit as the bullet will very, very likely break through all those bones in the foot. Still, there are no arteries down there and no vital organs, so since the foot is far away from any of those parts, you're very likely going to make it. We found the story in a medical journal of a 69-year-old man who'd accidentally shot himself in the foot while kangaroo hunting. While that would be forever a good joke to tell your buddies, the damage was significant because the bullet was a hollow point and the weapon was a 222 caliber rifle. That was enough to almost take his foot off. He was one tough dude driving himself home after the accident. He did that after he'd fractured his second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsals and lost lots of tissue. Some of the bones couldn't be wired because the bullet had completely shattered them. Surgeons had to use something called a gracilis muscle flap to fill in what they called the defect or in layman's terms, space. In nine months, he was up and walking again almost normally. He was very lucky. That same medical journal said that in some cases of foot shootings, there is so much damage to the bones and soft tissue that surgeons have to amputate below the knee. This just shows you that there is really no good place to get shot, unless you count the earlobe or the hair. Worse than being shot in the foot, we think, is being shot in the knee, something that has served as a very painful punishment in the past, made famous in Ireland during the Troubles, when someone stepped out of line in a place where the paramilitaries did their unique kind of policing. It wasn't supposed to kill a person, but you can be sure that the victim who'd committed the perceived transgression would be forever traumatized by the experience. This wound could not only break the cap of the knee, but also cause a fair bit of neurovascular damage, and if the wound was really bad, off came the leg. Sticking with Ireland, kneecapping was sometimes reserved for people who sold drugs, but if the crime was really bad, the victim might have gotten what was called a six-pack, which meant bullets to their knees, ankles, and elbows. Jesus Murphy, that must have hurt. So in terms of the worst places to get shot, ask someone who's had a six-pack. We actually found someone who got a four-pack back in 2010. He told the BBC I was shot in the shin, thigh, ankle, and calf. I was in shock, but shouted to my girlfriend, call an ambulance, then I passed out. He'd been accused of selling drugs, although he denied he ever did. It's hard to believe that it happened not that long ago since the troubles are long gone, but it seems some groups still do that kind of thing. We found evidence reported by the US National Institutes of Health that talked about 32 victims of fairly recent punishment shootings in Ireland. The article suggested the days of the six-pack are over, but explained this was the outcome back in the day during the troubles. Typically, mortality with this technique was high, and the functional morbidity in survivors was extreme. As such, this made it unpopular within the local communities the paramilitary groups were supposedly representing. So, the chance of dying was high and survivors were left with severe disabilities regarding the body parts that were hit. We're going to go out on a limb here and say that being shot in six of your joints is about as bad as it can get in terms of excruciating pain. That is, if you don't pass out. This is how one person said just getting shot once in one knee feels like. Getting shot in the knee, not just a glancing blow, it's going to be immediately and excruciatingly incapacitating. You won't be able to walk or crawl away, you'll just fall down and scream like a baby. 
But do you remember that guy, Ed Sizemore, we talked about? The one from the US Federal Law Enforcement Training Center's firearms? He had something different to say. He believed that getting shot in the femur would hurt the most, although he was of course guessing. No one person could compare getting shot in every part of their body. When we research our pain shows and read countless articles that say the femur was the most painful bone to break, and it also depends on the grade of the injury, because grade 1 might mean a light injury and a grade 3 femur injury could mean someone is close to death. This is how a medical paper described a grade 2 two femur injury after a bullet penetration. Segmental bone destruction is present with numerous small and large fragments. The bullet has disintegrated and dispersed throughout a wide area of muscle and subcutaneous tissue. The paper only talked about pain once, saying, The patient had constant thigh pain, a fever, and persistent serosanguineous drainage from the bullet entry site. We can't find anyone online talking about how getting shot in the femur felt like for them, but after reading that paper, we think we'll agree with Mr. Sizemore and say this is definitely one of the worst places to take a bullet. Ok, moving on to a spot we doubt you thought of. We imagine many of you have seen a movie made by Quentin Tarantino that shows a man howling in pain after being shot. One of the other characters says back to him, listen to me, you're going to be fine. Along with the kneecap, the gut is the most painful area a guy can get shot in, but it takes a long time to die from it. I'm talking days. You're going to wish you were dead, but it takes days to die from your wounds. Time is on your side. The movie, of course, is Reservoir Dogs and the character is Mr. White, played by Harvey Keitel. The question is, how much research did Quentin Tarantino do before he wrote that part of the script? He's correct in saying that gut wounds are eminently treatable and as long as the victim doesn't get a catastrophic infection and the stomach acid doesn't do much damage damage to the other organs, the victim may well pull through and go on to live a normal life. As for real life experiences, one person said this, My old partner had been shot in the stomach with a 45 pistol in Vietnam off a bar stool in Saigon. He said he didn't feel anything at first, then it burned like a hot poker had been jabbed in him. Right below that comment is another secondhand story, this time from a soldier who said he was told by another soldier about being hit in the stomach. The outcome was the same again, with no immediate severe pain but hot stinging after. We're sure the morphine helped a bit too, which the soldier later received. We found one guy who said getting shot in the stomach wasn't fun at all. He described his ordeal like this, For me it's more of a punch feeling than a piercing feeling. The bullets do not easily penetrate my abdominal muscles, thus inner organ damage is either minimal or non-existent. For an average person, the bullet will travel into the small bowel, colon, stomach, rupturing these organs. The contents, particularly the colon, cause site contamination, causing the victim to become septic and die from infection. This obviously hurts a great deal, and it's not fun for me either. For weeks I had a huge bruise on my abdomen. So, yes, we'd say it's a pretty bad place to get shot, but very much survivable. Well done, Quentin. You did your homework. Virginia Hall Goylot was an American spy with the British Special Operations Executive during World War II. She was known by many aliases, including Marie Monin, Germaine, Diane, Marie of Lyon, Camille, and Nicholas. The German Gestapo reportedly considered her the most dangerous of all Allied spies. Following the war, she worked in various elements of the CIA until she retired. And she did all of this with a prosthetic leg, which she named Cuthbert. Welcome to today's episode of the infographic show, The Limping Lady, Virginia Hall. It is said that Hall was a legendary intelligence officer. She organized agent networks, recruited Frenchmen and women to run safe houses, and assisted escaped prisoners of war. She excelled in her role as a World War II spy, and the Gestapo desperately wanted to apprehend the limping lady. So how did a simple girl from Baltimore, Maryland, end up climbing the ranks of the British Special Operations? Hall attended Roland Park Country School, and then the prestigious Radcliffe College and Barnard College, where she studied French, Italian, and German. But she was drawn to Europe, and so traveled the continent studying in France, Germany, and Austria, before landing a job as a consular service clerk at the American Embassy in Warsaw, Poland in 1931. Hall was an adventurous outdoors type, and in 1932 she accidentally shot herself in the leg while on a hunting trip in Turkey. Her leg was later amputated from the knee down and replaced with a wooden appendage, which, as we said, she named Cuthbert. Hall headed back to the US, where she attended graduate school at American University in Washington, DC. For most people, losing a leg might be enough to send them running home to take a job in the local bakery or florist. But not for Hall, she had greater ambitions. In 1940, she joined the ambulance service in Paris, France, and then in 1941, she made her way to London and volunteered for Britain's newly formed Special Operations Executive. She spent the next 15 months helping to coordinate the activities of the French underground in Vichy, an occupied zone in France. Hall was great at her job, which was good for the Allied forces, but it meant she also started to make waves with the enemy. And in November 1942, when operating in Lyon, France, Hall knew she had to flee. The German Gestapo posted a notice all over France, 
The woman who limps is one of the most dangerous allied agents in France. We must destroy her. She was being stalked by an equal adversary who had been tasked with removing Hall from rising the ranks as a British spy. Gestapo chief Nicholas Klaus Barbie, who was also known as the Butcher of Lyon, was on her tail. The Nazis believed Hall to be Canadian, and Barbie once reportedly told his colleagues, I'd give anything to lay my hands on that Canadian biatch. Hall had certainly gone under the skins of these Gestapo agents. She made the decision to escape France by crossing the border into Spain. But how could she trek through the mountains with Cuthbert, her wooden left leg? Well, she had no choice, as Barbie was sure to hunt her down and arrest, torture, and likely kill her. So Hall linked up with some other resistance members and vanished into the Pyrenees Mountains that separate France and Spain. This courageous lady carried a rucksack and hiked up the snow by dragging her prosthetic leg using her good right leg as a snowplow, according to Judith Pearson's 2005 biography of Hall, The Wolves at the Door. At one point during the journey, she was able to send a message to her liaisons in London telling them that Cuthbert was giving her trouble. They replied, if Cuthbert is giving you difficulty, have him eliminated. Hardworking Hall eventually made it to Spain. After the war, 40-year-old Hall was eager to remain in the intelligence business. She spoke Italian fluently and headed to Venice. For several years, she was responsible for collecting and transmitting financial, economic, and political intelligence in her role monitoring the development of communism. She eventually joined the CIA on December 3, 1951, a natural footstep on Hall's career path, and for the next 15 years, she used her covert action expertise in a wide range of agency activities, chiefly in support of resistance groups in Iron Curtain countries. She eventually retired at the age of 60 in 1966. During her career, Hall served a number of nations and they all acknowledged her courage. The French government awarded her the Croix de Guerre avec Palme, Britain's King George gave her the honor of member of the British Empire, and General William Donovan, the legendary head of the Office of Strategic Services, presented her with a Distinguished Service Cross. President Truman wanted to present Hall with the award himself in a public ceremony, but she turned down the offer as she was concerned it would reveal too much to the enemy. After she died on July 8, 1982, newspapers wrote up her obituaries in the back pages. The Washington Post and the New York Times used brief Associated Press obituaries that were several paragraphs in length, and the Baltimore Sun, the newspaper from her hometown, wrote up a more thorough account of her life with around 14 paragraphs. Later, in 2006, the CIA hung an oil painting of Hall that shows her inside a barn in southern France in 1944, using a suitcase radio powered by an automobile generator and bike parts to transmit messages to London. And the agency also named a training facility after her, called the Virginia Hall Expeditionary Center. It could be argued that Virginia Hall is one of America's greatest heroes, yet very few people have even heard of this amazing woman. Maybe that's all about to change though, as in 2017, the Hollywood press reported that Paramount Pictures is considering making a movie about Virginia Hall. The studio acquired the rights to another soon-to-be-published book about her life, A Woman of No Importance, by the journalist Sonia Purnell. According to the film website IMDb, the studio has attached Star Wars' Daisy Ridley to play Hall. Whether the film will be made, we are yet to find out. Two minutes before being shot, Polly takes a great big lick of her Rocky Road ice cream. She giggles self-consciously as it drips over her hand because her father James is watching her grinning while shaking his head. Slow down, Holly, says Jessica, Holly's mother. Holly tells her it's not her fault, it's melting, it's just too hot today. The Robinson family is having the time of their lives on vacation in Florida. This is a dream come true for the working class family from Clackheaton, West Yorkshire in Northern England. Despite constant negative news in the US about Florida, for this family it's a place of sheer beauty and wonder. They've already visited Walt Disney World in Orlando, and of course Holly had about a hundred photos taken with her favorite pair of Disney characters, Mickey and Minnie Mouse. It's been the perfect holiday so far for the two parents who worked ungodly hours for years to get to America. It was worth it. The US is everything and more than they expected it to be. They've heard that some parts of Florida could be dangerous for tourists at night, and they're old enough to remember the couple, also from West Yorkshire, who was shot by a gang while on vacation there. The unfortunate married couple was just resting on the side of the road in their rental car when they were blasted with bullets. Totally innocent people who just didn't want to hand over all their holiday savings. The guy died and the woman survived and after it was reported, it made British folks think twice about vacationing across the pond. But that was back in 1993. It was all over the British press. More so because nine foreign tourists had been murdered in Florida in the space of just one year. Street gangs were everywhere back then, but the Robinsons have been told that the US is much safer now and as long as they stay away from just a few no-go areas of Florida, 
they definitely won't meet with any trouble. And if you were to stop them in the street and ask them at this very minute, they would tell you that the US is not as dangerous as everyone makes it out to be. Just about every American they've met so far has been more than friendly. People have been so welcoming, from the staff at the hotel to the folks they've met in the streets. Americans, said Jessica after just a few days, are way more friendly than Brits. James couldn't agree more. So as they walk down Ocean Drive on South Beach in Florida's famed Miami Beach, they're not exactly on their guard. This stretch of road is utterly amazing, with its pretty white buildings looking so cute compared to the grim gray buildings of the family's town in industrial Yorkshire. Holly licks her arm, where the dripped rocky road is now forming a series of veinous rivulets. Ta-da, she says after she's lapped up the last line. Look, Dad, your sweet, lovely breath vaporized my ice cream, she says sarcastically. James does have beer breath from drinking earlier at the nearby Irish pub. This will come back to haunt him big time, but not for a while yet. One minute before being shot. The Robinsons are right in some respects, Florida isn't really that dangerous, not in the tourist areas anyway. Not usually. But on this day, it is. Little do the Robinsons know that there's a gang beef being settled on Ocean Drive on this particular day. That beef is between a Haitian immigrant gang known as Zoe Pound and one of the Crips gangs. Such gang beefs have led to a bunch of murders and drive-by shootings as of late, but the tourist areas are usually spared from such violence. Thing is, there's a lot of money to be made selling cocaine where tourism-focused nightlife is abundant, and right now, these two gangs are in somewhat of a disagreement when it comes to drug-dealing turf. But they've arranged to meet in the day in what should be a safe, crowded place to talk things over. It has to be said, though, that friendly dialogue and diplomacy are not their strong points. At this very moment, a Zoe Pound gang member feels a Crips gang member has insulted him. In reality, he's being what you might call overly sensitive. But that's all it takes for guns to be drawn. Mere words are spoken, and bang, 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 bang. Minute 1. Screams ring out on Ocean Drive as people run for cover. Gang members lay out on the street, puddles of blood forming below their close-to-dead bodies. You can already hear a siren in the distance. Surely, the cops can't be coming already. Minute 2. James Robinson has his daughter Holly cradled in his arms. Tears are streaming down his face. He's shouting, someone call an ambulance. He isn't even aware that he's also been shot. No, 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 he cries. Holly, Holly, look at daddy. Holly's eyes are closed. James doesn't know if she's unconscious or dead. Blood is all over him, leaking from Holly's head. He looks to his side and sees his wife Jessica down on the floor clutching her stomach. At least she's conscious, but she's moaning and groaning. Minute 3. James isn't much of a reader, so before he and his family went to Florida, he knew little about the fact that 2021 was one of the worst years for U.S. homicides with a firearm. There were around 21,000 deaths, covering murders, accidents, and homicides all related to gun violence. That number now stands at the peak of a line that's been traveling upward for years. You have to go back to 1994 to see numbers so high, but James didn't know, and he also wasn't aware that the USA has the most heavily armed citizenry in the world. Every year, there are usually over 100 people who are shot and killed by accident just because they stood too close to where guns were fired. James's friends were wrong to tell him that the US is much safer now. The US is as violent, or if you believe the statistics, much more violent than just a few years ago. James doesn't know it, but on that same weekend he and his family are shot, 17 people are killed with a firearm across the whole country. Minute 4. The police and an ambulance are already on their way. It's at this point that James realizes he's also been hit. It's taken a while for the pain to register, but even now he only feels a slight throbbing pain. This is partly because he's in shock, but it's also because you can be shot in various parts of your body where the pain you feel isn't too bad at all. It's just a good thing he wasn't shot in the kneecap because that really hurts. Jessica, though, she's been shot in the place you really don't want to be shot. The abdomen. She's in agony. So much agony she can't really help her daughter and husband. She can't seem to move either. She doesn't know it, but she's been hit in one of the worst places when it comes to complications. She's been shot by a high-velocity firearm and that bullet was traveling at 2,000 feet per second when it entered her. The bullet has not hit any main arteries, so she can be thankful for that. Still, this bullet has made its way into her intestines, and right now acid and intestinal bacteria are leaking inside of her. She has no idea that the injury to her peritoneum, which is a thin tissue that goes around the inner wall of the abdomen and lines the abdominal organs, is not good news at all. In short, all the bad stuff, the bile, feces, and all that nasty stuff everyone has in their stomachs is leaking out because this thin tissue has been damaged. This can be bad. Very bad. She's at least breathing, but in some cases a bullet to the abdomen can hit an artery and the person can go into cardiac arrest. 
If that happened to Jessica, there'd be a 90% chance she wouldn't get home to tell all her buddies about Walt Disney World and the photogenic Mickey Mouse. Still, now she has sprung a leak, and she could die from the sometimes deadly peritonitis. Minute 5 Come on, darling, open your eyes. James keeps saying to Holly, who's still not responsive. Where's the ambulance, he screams, as people are now crowding around the family, some taking photos and videos with their phones and already putting them online. As you'll see, while they're doing this for all the wrong reasons, it can also be helpful. James looks at Jessica, who has just collapsed into a heap. Now her groaning is faint and her face is pale. That's because the reduced blood flow in her body means a decrease in the number of red blood cells. This interrupted blood flow is also why she just slumped over. Minute 6 the ambulance is here already, as are the cops. The paramedics head straight over to the family and call for more paramedics once they see how many people are down. Right now, two of the gang members are already dead. Some are injured and about 12 guys have run away. Incidentally, when James was a teenager, he'd been stabbed in a disagreement over who was the better football team, Leeds United or Huddersfield Town. Stabbings in the UK, where guns aren't as available, are often the go-to action when violence gets ugly. It's less dangerous than being shot, with about an 8% fatality rate compared to one-third of people dying when they take a bullet or bullets. If you get shot in the heart, your chances of surviving are pretty slim, with a fatality rate of about 25%. Being stabbed there has a fatality rate of 12%, but you can be hit in the leg or arm and not feel much, and then bleed out and die because the bullet hit an artery. One minute you're wondering what happened and the next you're on the floor, close to death. But another place you certainly don't want to get shot in is the head. Our precious little Holly is experiencing that right now. Minute 7 She's still unconscious as she's placed into the ambulance. The paramedics are now looking for other injuries besides the obvious one in her head, where they can see the entry wound. There's no exit wound, so the bullet is still inside her. That's very unfortunate. Gunshot wounds to the head give you a 42% chance of survival, but most of the survivors are hit in the extremities of the head, so the bullet just glances off. Taking one right in the head and pulling through is very tough, and even if you do survive, you might never be able to use a spoon again. If you're shot in the head and the bullet penetrates the brain, you have only a 5% chance of surviving. Fortunately for Holly, she's not been hit in the side of the head, which helps as you'll soon see. But right now, the paramedics aren't spending too much time speculating about the trajectory of the bullet, just as they've learned in their training. All their efforts focus on keeping Holly alive and looking for other injuries. They've also been very careful to survey the scene. After all, more bullets could fly. They don't know if the shooters are still around. Holly is still breathing, but her neurological status is unresponsive. The paramedics palpate her head and face, meaning to examine it with their fingers, looking for deformities or any leakages. They also check to see if her pupils react to light because non-reactive pupils can be a sign of significant head trauma. In Holly's case, there's certainly a bit of that. Now they've set off, taking the fastest route to the nearest emergency room. Due to the seriousness of her injuries, they're going a bit faster than the usual 70 to 80 miles per hour. Minute 8 Jessica is now in the ambulance and paramedics are palpating her distended stomach. Because it's distended, they consider intra-abdominal bleeding. One of them writes down, hemorrhage and possible spillage of gastrointestinal contents. She's conscious and obviously in a lot of pain, which further indicates a leak. Her breathing is also shallow, so the paramedics open up her airways and give her oxygen. As for the external hemorrhage, they focus on preventing more loss of blood. She's cleaned and her wound is covered to prevent infection, although there's not much they can do about the spillage inside her and how that might cause a deadly infection. When she's given fluids intravenously as well as antibiotics, she's not given painkillers just yet because it can obscure diagnosis with such possibly complicated injuries. Bullet wound injuries are most of the time complicated, given that you don't know what damage a bullet traveling at high speed can do. Anyway, Jessica is almost passed out right now. Minute 15 It seems that James is the most fortunate member of the family, although right now he wishes it was him that was the worst off, not his daughter and wife. He's actually chatting to the paramedics trying to explain to them what happened. He still doesn't really feel much pain. That's because, while we said bullet wounds are usually complicated, James has been shot in his leg and there's a clear exit and entry wound. The bone in his thigh, the nerves and the major vessels are all undamaged. The paramedics have wrapped up his wound, but when he goes to the hospital after having a thorough check, he'll be given some antibiotics and what's called surgical debridement. That's just cleaning of the wound, removal of dead tissue, and a bit of sewing up if necessary. He'll also have scans, of course, because the doctors will want to know what's going on inside, as bullets can fragment into little splinters. They don't want to just patch him up if there's still something inside of him. But James will be fine. Being shot has been a walk in the park for him, which is quite unusual. His wife, though, is at risk, and his daughter, well, she's walking a tightrope in the wind while being pelted with bird poop. Minute 18 We now have a crime scene. One thing all police are told about crime scenes is they need to be preserved as much as possible. That means cordoning them off so there's minimal contamination. 
First responders approach with caution, looking around for any clues in the environment. The first officer logs all the details, such as location, time, and the number of people thought to be involved. They're also very aware of people leaving the scene, getting into cars, stuff like that. Then they scan the actual scene, taking in any information that might be relevant. They also look for possible dangers that might still be present, and not just human danger but things like weapons and even chemical threats. In this case, people are still around, so the cops start interviewing any witnesses. They allow the medical staff to do their job, but in doing that, they still try to keep the scene as uncontaminated as possible. As this was a mass shooting in broad daylight, the case shouldn't be too hard to solve. It also involves a family, tourists no less, so it'll eventually become global news. That means a lot of pressure on the police. One of the gang members is currently being tended to by the second team of paramedics, and cops are also there to try to get what's called a dying declaration. In this case, the dying man looks up at the cops and says, Screw you, pig. Some of the people nearby are possible suspects and witnesses, so now the cops have them secured and they're all separated. That's important. They have a saying in the police in regard to crime scenes, and that's identify, establish, protect, and secure. They've also established possible routes of escape, and right now police cars are scouring the streets where shooters might be. As for the men that are being put into ambulances, cops have noted where they were found. The same goes for any items at the crime scene, their location is noted. Minute 20. Detectives arrive on the scene and are briefed by the first responders. They decide who they should call, like forensic folks, legal counsel, and people that might bring special equipment to the scene. IDs are taken from all the people nearby. They also get any photos or videos that have been taken since the start of the incident. Plus, as they're doing these so-called walkthroughs, they're taking pictures themselves. Several detectives do their own walkthroughs, always ensuring no evidence is compromised. If the crime scene is even slightly compromised, it could result in a gang member who took part in the shooting, getting off, and killing again in the future. Soon, they'll remove some of the evidence and ensure it's preserved, packaged, and safely transported, all the time being very careful about cross-contamination. It'll be sent to either an evidence storage facility or a crime laboratory. Minute 25 The doctor treating Jessica said, after his visual evaluation and some abdominal ultrasonography, that peritonitis is present, but since bullets to the stomach can cause all kinds of injuries to multiple organs, more checks will need to be done. He can't see that with his eyes, so now she seems stable enough, she's sent to a room where she can have a multi-detector CT scan. There's a very real chance that her peritonitis can lead to the sometimes deadly sepsis, and it most likely would lead to that if she wasn't getting any treatment. It still could anyway. Sepsis is a bodily process where your immune system is actually trying to help you. It's the body's extreme natural response to fighting an infection. The body releases an army of chemicals thinking it's come to save the day, but the chemicals actually damage the seemingly infected tissues, and this can lead to multiple organ failure and death. The bad news is that abdominal sepsis is the worst sepsis, with a mortality rate of a staggering 72%. Even among those released from hospital, only 30% of them survive the year. This is why Jessica is given a massive dose of intravenous antibiotics to prevent sepsis from happening. Minute 45 the scans look good, at least as good as it could after being shot. The bullet hasn't damaged any other of Jessica's organs, but she'll still need surgery to remove the bullet and fix that hole inside of her. It's Holly now who's in a really bad way. Minute 90 The detectives do another walkthrough, what's sometimes called a final survey. All the evidence they have will become a part of a case file, as will forensic and technical reports made by experts in the near future. Sometimes these files will fill many boxes, but other times, these kind of crimes are much easier to solve. Still, guilty men have gotten away with murder because of bad case files or contaminated evidence, and sometimes innocent men go to prison for the same reason. We'll tell you later if the Robinsons get the justice they deserve. Minute 120 If you get shot in the side of the head, the bullet will very likely kill you. And even if it doesn't, the damage to the brain will be vast, and the person might live on a vegetative state or with severe physical and mental disabilities. The best brain injury caused by a bullet, if we can say that, is when only part of one of the two halves of the brain are damaged. It's still not good. You can't really get away with a brain injury of any kind, even just a nick. The bullet has indeed stuck itself inside of Holly's head. So she has what's called a penetrating wound. Her brain has been scanned once again, and the good news is there is no severe blood clotting. There is some swelling, but not so much that she'll not get through the night. Sometimes this kind of swelling can kill you faster than you expect. She's in intensive care right now and will be for some time. Doctors just have to keep a keen eye on her. Day 2 Jessica is already sitting up in bed and talking. The antibiotics are working their magic even though she's still in a bit of pain. Morphine takes care of most of that. At the moment, she doesn't feel well enough to go see her daughter, although James, who's walking about as normal, fills her in on the details. They still don't know how things will turn out. Holly is in an induced coma after just coming back from surgery to have the bullet removed. People are put in induced comas to slow the body down. 
This lessens the demand for glucose, oxygen, and blood and allows the swelling to go down. She's a lucky girl. As you know, 95% of headshots that lead to brain injury result in death, but of those that do make it to the emergency room still breathing, there's still a 50% chance they won't make it. The fact Holly is still alive is a miracle. Day 15 Holly looks up from her hospital bed. Mommy and Daddy look really funny. She can't see right. Bits are missing. This is because she has damaged the right hemisphere of the brain. The doctors actually told James and Jessica that what's actually happened is a best case scenario when you consider brain injuries. Holly's spatial awareness is all off. She has problems remembering things and is often confused. She's also acting weird, like she just can't interpret the emotions of others at all. Sometimes she's completely ignoring what's in her left field of vision, and when asked about that, she doesn't seem to be able to form a proper reply. She still has her sense of humor, but that sense of irony she used to have is all gone. There will be no sarcasm for now. But amazingly, this is the worst of the damage besides some weakness in her left arm and hand. Day 200 The police already have three men in custody, but what do you think they've been charged with? In the case of the Robinsons. After all, it was an accident and they didn't want to kill any Brits. Well, there are quite a lot of degrees of murder and sometimes very similar crimes will result in different charges and convictions. In this case, the police are saying there was a transferred intent to murder. With transferred intent, it means the killer was trying to kill someone else, but an innocent person was hurt. The intent to murder someone was still there, though. So in this case, it's attempted murder with transferred murder. Also, because the guys used guns in a street where there were lots of people, in legal terms you can say they acted with extreme indifference to human life. Whatever the case, they will be spending much of the rest of their lives in prison. Day 365 Have you done your homework? Jessica shouts in the direction of Holly's bedroom in their small house in Cleckheaton. Have you become bored of asking me the same questions all the time? Holly responds with a smile on her face. She's not quite back to normal yet, still having problems with her vision, her attention, and often saying the wrong things in social situations, but the rehabilitation has helped a lot. James and Jessica are happy about that, but not so happy about having to sell the house. Holly's treatment alone cost just over $400,000. That's on top of all the medical expenses they had to pay in the US. All medical treatment in the UK is free. The same doesn't apply to the US where healthcare costs are the most expensive in the world. Being poor, the Robinsons only bought the cheapest travel insurance in the UK, and naturally they didn't read the small print. Now the insurance company is refusing to pay out, invoking a clause in the contract about recklessness and intoxication. The report from the hospital revealed that Jessica and James had alcohol in their blood, which was true. They had a few pints at Finnegan's Way Bar on Ocean Drive earlier that day. Because of a few pints, the insurance company is refusing to pay any of their medical bills. Always read the small print. From now on, say the Robinsons, they'll be staying on this side of the pond, even if the buildings are gray and old and there's no such thing as obesity causing burgers for 99 cents. The American Civil War, despite lasting only four years between 1861 and 1865, was one of the bloodiest conflicts of the modern era. With 620,000 American fatalities, it's still the most lethal war in United States history beating out even World War II by over 200,000 U.S. deaths. In a conflict this brutal, you'll find thousands of stories of despair, hope, cruelty, and endurance. But the extraordinary tale of Private Jacob Miller started out in a way that many other stories end. He got shot directly through the forehead. Stick around for an almost unbelievable story of a normal man beating death itself and staging a stunning escape that would put some of the best war movies to shame. The first amazing fact in a story full of them is that Jacob Miller was already a decorated hero before the fateful gunshot that turned him into a legend. At age 23, he enlisted with the Union in Logansport, Indiana, and was quickly thrust into the heat of battle. He cut his teeth in a number of skirmishes with Company G of the Illinois Infantry and Company K of the 9th Indiana Regiment, first making a name for himself in 1863 during a battle at Vicksburg, Mississippi where the Union troops were under the command of decorated general and later President Ulysses S. Grant. The battle, like many in the Civil War, was just one part of a long siege against a southern stronghold on the Mississippi that Grant wanted to claim on behalf of the Union. The Mississippi River was a vital supply line, so keeping control of it was a make-or-break deal for Confederate forces in the area. The Union forces stationed near Vicksburg made a number of dangerous charges in hopes of claiming the city, and one particular charge of note was manned entirely by volunteers. One of those volunteers was Private Jacob Miller. In recognition of his bravery in battle, he was one of the many participants of what became known as the Charge of the Volunteer Storming Party to receive a Medal of Honor from President Abraham Lincoln. 
It's been recognized by many historians that the victory at Vicksburg was just as vital a part of the eventual Union victory as the Battle of Gettysburg, which happened in Pennsylvania around the same time. It looked like Private Jacob Miller was going to have a long and illustrious military career ahead of him. However, three months after Vicksburg in September of 1863, the Battle of Chickamauga broke out in Georgia, and it changed the course of the promising soldier's life forever. During offensive operations from the Union Army of Cumberland, commanded by Major General William Rosecran, they were attacked and blindsided by the Army of Tennessee, commanded by Confederate Major General Braxton Bragg. The Confederates outnumbered the Union soldiers by 5,000 men, and they were also fighting on familiar territory. Company K of the 9th Indiana Infantry was in attendance, which of course meant that Jacob Miller was on the battlefield. The situation quickly spiraled out of control, and the battle became a bloodbath, with the highest number of casualties since the Battle of Gettysburg, almost 4,000 dead and scores more injured. In the chaos of the battle, Private Miller was stationed close to his company commander, Captain McConnell, no doubt a high-profile target for any bold Confederate sniper. Miller would later speculate that the sniper was likely aiming at McConnell while he was standing right in front of him, but missed instead sending a white-hot musket ball directly into Miller's forehead and dropping him to the ground like a lead weight. But by some minor miracle, despite the bullet passing all the way through Miller's skull and into his brain, he had survived. But there on the ground with a hole in his head covered in blood and unable to move, nobody could blame his fellow soldiers for assuming the worst. Miller would later recollect Captain McConnell telling the other troops that there was nothing that could be done for poor Miller as he was already dead. After the battle, the news of Miller's death would eventually make it back to his family. Nobody on earth was expecting him to come back from this, and that's what made the next series of events so incredibly remarkable. The fight was a devastating loss for the Union, and Miller, perhaps mercifully, lost consciousness as his compatriots retreated from the battlefield. Sometime later, when Miller regained consciousness, he was well behind the advancing Confederate line, considerably separated from anyone who would be able to or be willing to lend him a hand. The Confederates had likely assumed he was dead, just like his fellow soldiers. When Miller woke up, he was in a terrible state, as you'd probably expect from a man who'd been shot in the head by a sniper not so long ago. He recounted the first gruesome moments. At last, I became conscious and raised up in a sitting position. Then I began to feel my wound. I found my left eye out of its place and tried to place it back, but I had to move the crushed bone back as together as I could first. Then I got the eye in the proper place. I then bandaged the eye best I could with my bandana. Is anyone else feeling a little queasy after hearing that? But despite being in such a horrific condition, Private Miller's problems weren't over. They'd only just begun. Before he could get any medical attention, he needed to get back to his feet and escape the battlefield. Using his gun as a kind of walking stick, he was able to stealthily escape from the rear of the Confederate battle lines, walking among the enemies who'd have sooner finished him off than lend him a hand. He later remarked that he was covered in so much blood, it likely disguised the blue of his uniform and stopped the Confederates from identifying him as a Yankee. This was the first of many bizarre backhanded miracles that helped Miller survive in the unlikeliest of circumstances. Miller walked for miles across the blood-soaked fields of Georgia until he found an old by-road. His head was already beginning to swell from the injury, forcing his working right eye closed. In order to see while trudging painfully down the by-road, he needed to use his fingers to physically pry open his eyelids so he wouldn't bump into anything. Eventually, after walking longer than anyone could have expected, Miller collapsed on the side of the road and fell unconscious. Once again, Miller's mysterious luck saved him, as a pair of Union standard bearers were passing down the by-road and found Miller, loaded him onto a stretcher, and took him to the nearest field hospital. Civil War field hospitals in Georgia following the devastating Battle of Chickamauga were nothing short of a nightmare. Thousands of injured troops, some on the edge of death, being attended to by a comparatively tiny group of overstretched doctors, nurses, and field medics. After some time waiting in a large tent with many other wounded soldiers, Miller was eventually attended to by a nurse who untied his bandana and placed a damp cloth over his wound before giving him a canteen full of water to tide him over. When a doctor was able to look at him, the prognosis was not good. He refused to operate, explaining that Miller likely wouldn't survive the night and to attempt surgery would just put him through more unnecessary pain. He was taken back to the tent where he tried to sleep through the pain. The next morning, a nurse came through, noting down the names of the wounded who'd been transferred to a bigger hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Unfortunately, Miller was not on the list. The doctors deemed that he was too injured to be safely moved. He was assured that if the Confederates reclaimed the area and captured him, he'd be exchanged later. As you can probably guess, the prospect of being captured and held prisoner by the same people who put a bullet in his head didn't exactly thrill Private Miller. That's why he immediately started formulating a new plan. 
he'd go to Chattanooga on foot, even if it killed him. In his own astonishing words, I made up my mind, as long as I could, to drag one foot after another. I got a nurse to fill my canteen with water so I could make an effort in getting as near to safety as possible. I got out of the tent without being noticed and got behind some wagons that stood near the road till I was safely away, having to open my eye with my finger to take my bearings in the road. I went away from the boom of the cannon and the rattle of musketry. I worked my way along the road as best I could. At one time I got off to the side of the road and bumped my head against a low-hanging limb. The shock toppled me over. I got up and took my bearings again and went on as long as I could drag a foot, then laid down beside the road. Because Miller's luck seemed to swing on a pendulum between terrible and extremely good, he wasn't crumpled on the side of the road for long. Not far from where he was laying, the wagons carrying the wounded from the Georgia Field Hospital to Chattanooga were trundling along when one of the many in the back unfortunately succumbed to his wounds. But that unknown soldier's bad luck would prove to be a boon for Jacob Miller, as the wagon found him lying there half dead. They had room for just one more. The wagon took Miller to another harrowing scene in Chattanooga. In his own words, I was lying with hundreds of other wounded on the floor, almost as thick as hogs in a stock car. Some were talking, some were groaning. I raised myself to a sitting position, got my canteen, and wet my head. While doing it, I heard a couple soldiers who were from my company. They could not believe it was me, as they said I was left for dead on the field. They came over to where I was and we visited together till an order came from all the wounded that could walk to start across the river on a pontoon bridge to a hospital. We were to be treated and taken to Nashville. I told the boys if they could lead me, I could walk that distance. With his small group of companions, they made the long and treacherous walk to Nashville, stopping at a bridge that was occupied by a long line of troops and artillery. When the troops and artillery had moved on, Miller and the others continued, stopping when they found the company K Teamster, who gave them the first food that Miller had eaten in two days at this point. They rested with the Teamsters and stocked up on rations, giving Miller an opportunity to meet a surgeon. Thanks to this surgeon, his wound was mercifully washed and dressed for the first time since he was shot. But Jacob Miller's journey still wasn't over. He was put on a wagon traveling toward Bridgeport, Alabama, with every bump on the road causing considerable pain to his gaping head wound. His companions noticed his discomfort and got off the wagon with him to walk the rest of the way to Bridgeport. During this part of the trek, Miller had regained the ability to open his right eye without the use of his fingers. Thank heavens for small mercies. When the group arrived in Bridgeport, they took a train to Nashville. Miller lay in the carriage in a state of bone-deep exhaustion. Having undergone a journey so brutal over the previous few days, it had taken everything out of him. But the one thing that wasn't taken out of him was the musket ball. The doctors in Nashville refused to operate, so he was transferred to a hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. His luck was starting to run out as the doctors here also refused to operate. Then he was transferred to a hospital in New Albany, Indiana, where, yep, you guessed it, the doctors refused to treat him again. For days, then weeks, then months, physicians across the Union played hot potato with Private Jacob Miller and the festering bullet in his head. After nine months of hell, being refused treatment by military doctors who feared that any surgery would kill him, Jacob Miller was furloughed back to Logansport, where he was first enlisted. Their local physicians, Dr. Fitch and Dr. Coleman, gave Miller some relief. They were able to surgically remove the musket ball that had been blasted through his skull almost a year earlier without killing him. In one particularly haunting detail, when the musket ball was removed, some reports suggested that the two doctors could see Miller's brain pulsating underneath. Once he'd stabilized following his surgery, Miller was sent back to the military hospital in the town of Madison, Indiana, where he rested and recovered until his enlistment expired. Despite everything working against him, Private Jacob Miller had survived the American Civil War. The first 17 years after the war were not easy for Miller, even after the worst of the shrapnel in his head had been removed. Like a lot of veterans, he found it difficult to reintegrate back to civilian life, a problem made even worse for him by his new, rather unique disability. He was blind in his left eye, and because of the lack of medical knowledge about brain surgery and facial reconstruction at the time, the bullet hole was left open in Miller's forehead, requiring daily cleaning to prevent its infection from reaching dangerous levels. The massive head trauma unsurprisingly also had lingering effects on the wounded soldier's health. He dealt with episodes of stupor and delirium, which some reports say caused him to wander around aimlessly at times, not entirely sure what was going on around him. This was an issue compounded by partial memory loss and even tragic hallucinations that he was serving in the war again. He would hold a stick against his shoulder as though it were a musket and march back and forth, holding a line that no longer existed. The ghosts of his past just wouldn't seem to leave poor Jacob behind. He also experienced dizziness and chronic headaches, which got particularly bad whenever he suffered from head colds. It caused pressure buildup inside of his skull, resulting in unimaginably horrific pain. 
Because of the debilitating nature of his injury, he was unable to work for the rest of his life and had to live on a government pension. Thankfully, things did get a little better for Jacob Miller after the first 17 years. Some of the buckshot fell out of the hole in his forehead. Then, 31 years after the initial shooting, two pieces of lead also fell from the hole, after which some of the worst of his personality-altering symptoms were alleviated. Anyone with a working knowledge of how lead exposure affects the human body probably won't be surprised to hear that. Despite suffering from chronic pain for the rest of his life, Jacob Miller became an active member of the veterans community. He joined a forebearer of the American Legion called the Grand Army of the Republic, where his fellow vets gave him the nickname Center Shot. We'll give you three guesses as to why. During his years as a civilian, he also married and had a child, living as normal life as men of his circumstances possibly could. In 1911, he gave a newspaper interview where most of the first-hand details of this incredible act of survival were recorded. In summation of the events of his life, he said, Some ask how it is I can describe so minutely my getting wounded and getting off the battlefield after so many years. My answer is I have an everyday reminder of it in my wound and constant pain in the head, never free of it while not asleep. The whole scene is imprinted on my brain as with a steel engraving. I haven't written this to complain of anyone being in fault for my misfortune and suffering all these years. The government is good to me and gives me $40 per month pension. Jacob Miller, after living an almost impossible life worthy of the history books, passed away at the ripe old age of 88 on January 13, 1917, leaving behind a legacy that will never be forgotten. It's Monday morning, and you're back at work after a weekend of sweet, sweet freedom. With coffee in hand, you walk into the elevator lobby and then step into the first available car going up. After 30 seconds of moving steadily upwards, your elevator suddenly jolts to a stop. Confused, you press the button for your floor again, but the elevator doesn't respond. Then suddenly, you hear something very worrisome. A distinct snapping sound, followed by a loud crashing sound against the top of your elevator. You realize that one of the steel cables holding the elevator up has snapped and come crashing down the shaft. You can hear a second cable starting to break, and nervously, you reach for your cell phone. You need help, and you need it now. Unfortunately, you never changed your cell phone service provider from T-Mobile, so you don't normally get service through a wet paper towel, let alone the steel walls of the elevator and the concrete shaft beyond it. In a full-blown panic now, you reach for the emergency call box, a landline that's typically wired directly to emergency services. But as you open the box, you're horrified to discover that T-Mobile runs this line too. Even the landline has no service because T-Mobile. Now you hear three more cables snap, and in a heartbeat, you're stuck inside the elevator, very quickly plummeting to the basement level. Can you survive the next few seconds? Can you really survive a falling elevator? Every year, 10 million people die from falling elevators. Just kidding. Elevators are actually one of the <laughs> safest methods of transportation and have a fatality rate of 0.0000015% per trip. In the United States, only 27 people die on average each year in elevator accidents, and almost all of these either involve people accidentally stepping into an empty elevator shaft due to a door malfunction or getting caught between a floor and the moving elevator. The latter can be quite horrific, as the upwards or downwards moving elevator shears the victim in half. The good news is that almost no fatalities occur due to elevators actually falling, which is pretty impressive given the estimated 18 billion elevator trips Americans take every year. Compare that to the 12,000 people who die every year from falling downstairs. That's right, stairs are the real killer here, and right now they're plotting to end you. Just think about that next time your friend shames you for wanting to take the elevator up two flights instead of the stairs. You're not being lazy, you're just playing the odds on how not to die. So what are the odds realistically that an elevator would fall out of control? Well, pretty negligible, to be honest. The vast majority of accidents that have occurred due to falling elevators have almost all been during the construction phase or during maintenance, when some key safety features may not have been implemented yet or taken offline temporarily. Before the elevator falls, it must suffer a failure of all four to eight cables which keep it held aloft. That's because just one of those cables is strong enough on its own to hold the elevator, so unless they all go, there's just no way that the elevator is going to come crashing down. If, by some miracle, all of the cables keeping the elevator suspended are sheared off, perhaps because of Godzilla or a Decepticon attack in your city, then the elevator must still experience a failure of electromagnetic brakes on the car itself. 
These brakes are designed to automatically kick in when the elevator exceeds a certain speed, making them almost foolproof. They can even slow a free-falling car down within just two to three stories, making the odds of a catastrophic crash pretty low. Automatic switches on the track itself can also kick in if an elevator is moving too fast and helps stop the car. If all these should fail, though, then finally, at the bottom there is typically a crash pad of sorts which is designed to crumple when struck by an elevator and help decelerate the elevator to what is hopefully survivable speeds. In fact, many modern automobiles feature crumple zones or areas on the front of the vehicle that are designed to give way structurally in a high-speed collision and crumple, thus reducing the kinetic energy being transferred to the cab and inevitably you. Hydraulic lift elevators lack some of these safety features, but these elevators only have a maximum height of three or four stories. You can often find these elevators in an apartment building due to their limited height. Even if one of these were to fail, there's little chance of the fall being fatal. Let's say, though, that you are one in a trillion. You have the worst luck in the universe. Maybe you were born under a ladder while your mother opened an umbrella indoors and a black cat crossed her path. Unlucky you shows up to work one day, gets inside the elevator, rides up a few floors, and suddenly you're in free fall. Can you survive? What's the first thing you think about when you think about surviving a falling elevator? Odds are it's probably trying to jump for your life. In theory, it's a solid move. The fall isn't what's going to kill you, but rather the sudden stop at the end. If you can somehow lower the speed your body hits that basement floor with, then you'll suffer less injury. Thus, by jumping at the last second before impact, you're negating some of your downwards velocity with muscle-powered upwards velocity. Pretty solid science. Except it kind of isn't. That's because unless you're an NBA player with some serious ups, you're only going to decelerate by about 2-3 to three miles an hour, which is going to do exactly diddly squat versus your 57 mile an hour falling speed. Also, there's the fact that when you're in a free falling elevator, you yourself are also at free fall, and gravity isn't keeping your feet firmly planted on the ground. You'll feel weightless, and you might as well be because trying to plant your feet on the ground and get enough upwards push to actually jump is going to be nigh impossible. Then there's the more obvious problem. How in the world are you going to time your jump? Most elevators have no way of showing you which floor you're currently falling through. That fast countdown you always see in the movies is there to build tension and drama. In real life, you'd have no idea what floor you're on, and no way to judge when you should jump once you near the bottom. Jump too soon and you'll come back down having negated zero of your downwards velocity, jump too late and, well, you know, you're dead. If jumping isn't the answer, then maybe you can take a tip from paratroopers and simply flex your knees. This theory states that you should square your body up and then flex your knees so your legs are at about 45 degrees. Then this should allow your legs to act like springs, lessening the force traveling up your body from the impact. Paratroopers often use this flexed knee approach when they're falling at a leisurely 6 to 8 miles an hour. It helps them avoid ankle injuries or broken legs. You, however, are making a mad dash to the bottom of the elevator shaft at dozens of miles an hour. Flexing your knees in this way isn't going to reduce much of the force traveling up your body. Worse, it's actually placing most of your bones perpendicular to the floor and making them much more prone to shattering like toothpicks. Clearly not an ideal solution. So then, how can you survive a fall? Well, it turns out that the best way to survive a free-falling elevator is to lay down flat on the floor, placing your hands behind your head to protect your skull from falling debris after the sudden stop. By laying flat on the floor, you'll spread out the force of the impact across a much larger area of your body, and it actually gives most of your bones a decent chance of making it intact. Even if smaller bones like your ribs snap like twigs, this technique comes with its own problems though, mostly that just like trying to jump at the last second because you're in free fall, it's going to be incredibly difficult to lay down flat. Also, there's the issue of putting your brain basically inches away from impact. And the brain is one of two organs you really want to keep intact to have a chance of surviving. All in all, though, this technique really does offer the best chance for survival, especially if you're on the chunkier side. If that's the case, then you want to lie down with your chunkiest bits towards the floor, as all the body fat will act like a shock absorber and dramatically increase your odds of survival. So there you go. Next time someone complains about your weight, tell them that in an elevator crash, you'll live and they'll die. Also ignore them because you shouldn't be friends with anyone who complains about your weight. Free falling elevators are kind of one of those catch 22s of life, and even if you do everything right, there's no guarantee of survival. The bottom of the elevator floor may turn into a tangled mess of shattered steel on impact, and with you lying directly on it, you'll end up impaled in a dozen or more places. Sometimes just staying upright can save your life, such as the case of Betty Lou Oliver. We're 
world record holder for longest fall survived in an elevator. In 1945, an American bomber accidentally crashed into the Empire State Building, and the crash severed the cables holding Betty Lou's elevator car. She fell a whopping 75 stories and crashed into the basement floor, and incredibly survived with some broken bones. That just goes to show you that life can be so random that sometimes it just makes no sense at all. Lying flat in a falling elevator, though, is scientifically speaking the best way to survive a free-falling elevator. With so few elevator accidents of this type around the world, though, what you should really be on the alert for is accidentally stepping through open doors and into an empty elevator shaft, or getting caught by closing doors and being trapped there when the car starts moving. What we're saying is that really it's not the car who's the real threat here, but rather the doors, though even elevator doors don't compare to the body count that regular old stairs have, making them the number one killer amongst devices to move us up and down buildings. Kinda makes you wonder if it's even worth it to use the stairs instead of the elevator in case of a fire, the way all the signs tell you to do. Hopefully after watching this episode, the next time you get stuck in an elevator you'll breathe a little easier. Now you know that there's virtually no chance of disaster, though you don't want to end up like Nicholas White either, who spent 41 hours stuck in a New York City elevator in 2008. The world's a tough place, and sooner or later you're gonna get hurt. Today we're gonna look at how to survive the most common injuries you may suffer in your life. Number 4. Stabbing Getting stabbed sucks. We know because we asked our resident challenge expert about his run-in with the wrong end of a sharp knife, and we'll let him explain. I was overseas, door-to-door -door stuff. Went through a door at the exact same time as a bad guy coming out. We both surprised each other, and as we ran into each other, we both dropped our rifles. I went for my sidearm, he went for his knife. I was just a second slower on the draw than him because of my body armor and the way I landed, and he pounced and slid a short knife into my side straight into my armpit. So what's the best way to survive being stabbed, whether on purpose or on accident? First, the best way to survive being stabbed is to not get stabbed. If someone pulls a knife on you, it's time to turn heels and elbows in the opposite direction. Don't try to be a hero or a billy badass and just book it. But what if there's nowhere to run? In that case, remember the 5 Ds of dodgeball. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. But alright, if you forgot the 5 Ds of dodgeball and you couldn't run away, how are you going to survive a stabbing? First, if you're able to, try to direct the stab to somewhere favorable. The human body is basically entirely a no-stab zone. But if you must, there's better places to direct an incoming stab than others. Places to avoid include your flanks, which will allow a knife to penetrate deeply and pierce one or more organs, a stab in the upper flank is especially dangerous, and our lab rat is lucky the incoming stab was in a generally upwards direction that completely missed his lungs. Lungs are extremely allergic to being stabbed, but a stab in the lungs has twofold dangers. First, you'll compromise the lung's ability to remain inflated and do its job, meaning you've seriously compromised your ability to breathe. Secondly, a punctured lung can fill with blood leading to a disastrous secondary effect to your health like a rapid death or a slow gurgling death as you choke to death on your own blood while asphyxiating. So where do you want to take a stab? If you're able to, put your forearms up and block or deflect the incoming blow. Even if the knife slips past your guard, you'll take a lot of kinetic energy out of the attack, limiting the penetrating power of the stab. You'll potentially get your forearm slashed to ribbons, but better than taking a knife through the ribs. By the way, prepare for some intense pain if the knife manages to ram straight into your forearm bones. A less ideal but more survivable location is to take a stab in the stomach. Stomach injuries are excruciatingly painful, but very survivable if you can get medical attention within 30 minutes to an hour. The recovery process will be extremely long, and you run the risk of serious internal infection if your stomach is ruptured and the contents spill out inside of you. After you've been stabbed, whether on purpose or by accident, the next important thing is to administer first aid as quickly as possible. If the impaling object is still sticking inside you, resist the urge to go all Rambo and rip it out. Instead, leave the object inside you and wrap a bandage around it, pressing firmly to stop or slow the bleeding. Pulling out the impaling object will open the wound up. As long as it's inside you, it's basically sealing the wound. If you've been stabbed or impaled in the chest, the most important thing to do is seal the wound as quickly as possible. That's because if air gets into your chest cavity, it can fill up the chest cavity and put pressure on your lung, which prevents it from expanding fully. This is known as collapsed lung and will lead to asphyxiation. A good way to treat a sucking chest wound is to use a piece of plastic directly on the hole and then press firmly using gauze or a dish rag or a piece of torn t-shirt, whatever's handy to staunch the bleeding. Number 3. Getting Shot Maybe you're hanging out at a shooting range or an American public school and suddenly it happens. You get plugged. How are you going to survive getting shot? First, it's important to assess the situation and get yourself to safety. 
Is whoever shot you still shooting at you or in the general area? Ask them politely to stop. If they refuse, get to safety. No point in surviving your first gunshot wound only to have to deal with an immediate second. Next, it's time to apply some immediate first aid. Because unlike a stabbing, a gunshot wound is typically exponentially more destructive to your internals. That's thanks to the massive shock and expansion your body experiences as a round penetrates, which can result in the creation of a brief internal cavity which your organs snap back into. You're going to be experiencing major blood loss, which, if you don't take immediate steps to address, will have you unconscious in as little as 30 seconds and dead in 60. So no matter how much bleeding there is or isn't, always treat a gunshot wound as if you'll be unconscious and helpless in 30 seconds, which means move fast. If you grew up in the 80s and 90s, immediately forget everything you saw in the movies about digging the bullet out. First of all, it's in no way immediately important to remove a bullet. Second, the bullet will likely have fragmented into dozens of tiny pieces requiring delicate surgery to find and extract. Third, sticking a knife inside you to dig out a bullet is a good way to complement a bullet wound with a stab wound. The first thing you want to do is stop or slow the bleeding. Immediately apply pressure to the wound with your hands, while you or a buddy tries to find a more suitable bandaging material. Once more, improvisation is key. A torn t-shirt, wad of paper towels, your annoying friend's screenplay that they won't shut up about. The only thing that matters is the material is absorbent enough to take in some of the blood and seal the wound tightly. Ideally, you'll want to use clean material, but a dirty dish rag lying in an alley will do in a pinch. You can deal with a blood infection after you've stopped littering the streets with said blood. Now, maintain pressure, and whatever you do, do not change the bandaging until a doctor or EMT does it for you. Even if you used a filthy rag and later find something much cleaner and are worried about infection, ripping off the bandaging will tear loose the blood clot that's hopefully forming to keep your Kool-Aid on the inside. Now that you got your immediate wound taken care of, check for an exit wound. Odds are, when you get shot, your body's going to respond with adrenaline, steroids, and a whole lot of natural painkillers. Given enough blood loss and a state of mental shock, you might not even feel any pain. Many soldiers have died after having one wound treated only to ignore the second wound they didn't even realize they had. That's right, the brain is a tricky thing, and if one wound is readily apparent but the second isn't, it can completely shut off the pain signal from the second wound as it struggles to deal with the shock of the first. Plug your exit wound the same way you did the entry wound, then make a move for safety or help. If help is already on the way, it's time to conduct a more thorough assessment. Carefully inspect the rest of your body for additional gunshot wounds or secondary wounds and treat each accordingly. We hope you're never in this situation, but we cannot stress enough how important this step is. If you've been shot in an extremity, elevate the wound while you wait for help. Unless the wound is on your torso or your head, you also want to keep your head at the lowest possible elevation. This will ensure that gravity helps blood flow to your brain and keep you conscious and alive. Number 2. Car Crash Given the frequency of auto accidents, it's bound to happen. Sooner or later, you're going to be in a car crash. Hopefully, it'll be of a less severe nature. First, wear a seatbelt. Seriously, it's 2021 and we can't believe we still have to tell people to do this. Wearing a seatbelt can reduce your chances of a fatal injury by 45% and of a moderate to critical injury by 50%. Seatbelts are even more useful in trucks, where they reduce the risk of fatal injury by 60% and a moderate to critical injury by 65%. It's not enough to just wear the seatbelt, though, you have to wear it properly. The upper part that crosses your chest can be uncomfortable on long car rides, or maybe it puts a total crimp in your style. But not wearing it can be just as bad as not wearing a seatbelt at all. Even worse, wearing the lap band only can lead to very serious pelvic injuries, especially for men who happen to like having a fully functional reproductive system. Next, you want to sit as upright as possible in your seat. Kicking your feet up on the dash is a great way to not only lose your feet, but have your knees smash through your face and turn your brain to pudding. If you're in the front seats, the deploying airbag can cause serious injuries to your legs and put you in a position in the subsequent crash that will have a greater chance of catastrophic spine or leg injuries. Next, if you see the crash coming, avoid throwing your hands up in a panic. The deploying airbags could cause serious injuries to your arms, hands, and even face in a game of stop hitting yourself that the airbag will definitely win. The best thing to do is instead keep your body as loose as possible instead of tensing up in anticipation of the crash. You probably heard of newborn babies surviving incredible falls or car crashes with relatively few injuries. A big factor in their survival is the fact that babies remain loose, allowing their body to better absorb and redistribute the incoming kinetic energy. Once the vehicle has come to a stop, conduct an immediate safety assessment. Even before you start tending to you or your passenger's wounds, you want to check the environment to see if it's safe. If the vehicle is on fire, or if you've landed in a ditch that's quickly filling with water, your first priority is to get yourself to safety. No point in treating wounds if you're just going to burn to death or drown. If your environment is safe and your wounds are serious, remain in the vehicle. 
Don't try to exit the vehicle as you could have spinal or head injuries you aren't aware of. It's generally best to remain in the vehicle until emergency services personnel extracts you themselves. Only leave the vehicle if necessary for safety's sake, or to treat a life-threatening injury with first aid. This also applies if you find yourself at the scene of a car accident. Leave the victim in the vehicle unless absolutely necessary to move him. Always allow medical personnel to make the decision to move an individual. If you come across a car accident victim that's been ejected from the vehicle, the same rule applies. Move them only if there's a safety risk. If possible, treat any life-threatening injuries without moving them, as once more you could make a spine or head injury exponentially worse by moving the victim. Number 1. Acid For the last decade, there's been a persistent trend in men attacking women with acid, with the goal of splashing it on their faces. The aim of the attack isn't so much to kill as it is to horribly maim and disfigure. Whatever the cause of your run-in with acid is, knowing what to do can not only save your life, but seriously reduce the scarring of an attack. If the acid is in powder form, first try to reduce your exposure by vigorously brushing it off your skin. You can ideally do this with a shirt sleeve or gloved hand, but vigorously brushing it off with a bare hand will not leave much time for the acid to work on your flesh. If the acid is in liquid form, don't attempt to brush it off with your hand or any other body part, even if it's protected. This will only spread the acid around, making treatment much more difficult and potentially increasing future scarring and disfigurement. Instead, immediately flush water over the affected area and continue doing so until emergency medical services arrive. Water will help dilute the acid and, if applied quickly enough, can help prevent permanent disfigurement. If water isn't available, use any other type of liquid on hand. Milk is also ideal, as it'll help neutralize the acid, as well as products with a high concentration of water such as beer. The key is to pour as much liquid as possible for as long as possible, diluting and washing away the acid. If the acid's gotten to the eyes, immediately flush them with water and continue flushing them with water until help arrives. Make sure to pry open the eyelids and get water under the eyelids, as the acid can come to rest there or be pushed there by the water. Next, remove any clothing affected by the acid and move from under the puddles formed by the water treatment to prevent secondary injury to your feet or legs. The first thing you might think when you ask yourself how you might survive prison is what prison are we talking about? Not all prisons are made equal, and you could say there's a big difference from life in Thailand's infamous Bang Quang Central Prison, aka the Bangkok Hilton, and a progressive place of containment in the country of Sweden. We might also note Dostoevsky's famous line, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. We've all likely watched TV episodes featuring the world's worst lockups, but of course, we can't do a show on how to survive in all the various types of prisons in the world. Today, we'll talk mostly about US prisons, the good, the bad, and the very ugly. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, How to Survive in Prison. So, you've been handed a prison sentence and have survived jail. It's your first time inside, and you are no doubt worried about how you'll get along. You watch the movies depicting daily violence and a hierarchy of men living out a dog-eat-dog -dog lifestyle. You are far from being a hardened criminal. Let's say you're in a large joint such as California's San Quentin prison, a place you've likely seen on TV at some point. On your first day, you'll be booked, and you'll go through what is called an admission and orientation interview. This will decide what part of the prison you'll be housed in and if you have any special medical needs. You'll also be given clothing and other stuff like hygiene items. Yep, you'll have to strip and do that bending forward and coughing motion so that guards know you're not hiding things in your posterior crevice. You'll just have to get used to this, so accept everything you're asked to do. Survival tip number one, which should be obvious, is do what you are told and don't make a fuss. Obviously, if you're being abused, it's a different matter. As we said, you're no gangbanger and you're not a former cop, sex offender, or police informant. You don't need to be kept away from certain people. You're now in your new home or housing unit. How are you feeling? Well, the question was asked on Quora about first day prison experiences, and the top post on one thread started with one word, terrifying. The person added, I've never felt so alone in my life. My first week in jail, I had done in total solitary confinement. This was like the opposite of that, and yet I still felt more alone. Before we get to the matter of survival relating to violence, you have to figure out how to accept you'll be spending the next few years in this place or another similar place and how to keep yourself from not going crazy. Believe it or not, a lot of people will tell you that meditation is one thing that can help you get through prison. 
After all, close your eyes and be in the present with only your breathing to concentrate on, and in some respects, you could be anywhere. For a few minutes or more, you are not really in prison. In some places, you can actually join a prison contemplative program, and if that's available, we advise you to join. If you read about these programs, you'll find those who join them are less likely to be harmed, inflict self-harm, take drugs, and have more balanced emotions and even a heightened self-awareness. We can't express enough how much meditation will help you get through your sentence. Reuters wrote about such a program in one U.S. prison. Men in the meditation group reported significantly larger reductions in perceived stress, anxiety, depression, disassociation, and sleep disturbances than the inmates who didn't participate in this program. And yep, even the tough guys sometimes learn that shutting down your busy mind a couple of times a day will keep the demons away. Okay, you're going in the right direction, but meditating won't keep bullies away. If you've ever spoken to someone who has done a lot of time, they will likely tell you that to stay out of trouble, do not act like a tough guy right from the start. You see, even if you are tough, there will no doubt be someone tougher than you. If not, you can always fight with four strangers or someone who has come at you from behind on the prison yard with a shiv in hand. If you want to stay safe, keep your head down. That's not always easy because prison can be a hostile place. One person explained his first walk to his cell with other new inmates in San Quentin. Arms are hanging out the cells, holding mirrors, middle fingers from others, trash is flying down from the upper tiers, yelling and screaming the most horrible things. It's not exactly welcoming. He said he heard shouts directed at him with the words, Fudge you, I'm going to fudging stab you, let me see your butthole, you are going to die. We have of course used fudge to replace a harsher sounding expletive. Prisoners are not generally averse to breaching strictures of formal polite speech. You are, rightly, fudging terrified as a newbie walking down that busy floor to your cell, but just keep your head down and try to look calm. Look as though this scene means absolutely nothing to you. Don't try to laugh to look cool, as that is only inviting trouble. Even do a bit of meditative walking. Now you have arrived at your cell. You might be sharing the cell with someone, and it is of the utmost importance that you two get along. Remember, he was there before you, and you should respect his space and help clean the place. As one British guy who wrote a book on prison survival advises, having a sense of humor goes a long way in prison. Your life will be so much easier if you can help the other guy in the cell and others in the prison have better lives by occasionally making them laugh. Now you are there and settled. We've already told you not to break prison rules, but there are also unofficial inmate rules. One former US prisoner writes that it's not a good thing to get too friendly with the prison guards at the start as people might think you're a snitch. Snitching in prison is a huge no-no, and you must remember that some prisoners are waiting for any excuse to beat the hell out of someone. Don't give anyone that excuse. If you get labeled a snitch, your life will be hell, and you might have to get moved to protective custody. So from the start, don't act tough, have a sense of humor if possible, and be polite to other prisoners. There are some other things you should be careful about. Some folks might be looking to take advantage of you. If at all possible, try not to borrow stuff in prison. If you have cash, don't tell people about it. Don't start asking people why they are in prison. Try to stay away from drugs. Heroin might ease the day, but it quickly takes back everything it gives. Getting caught with drugs will get you more time, and borrowing drugs can lead to a life of pain. Despite what you have seen on TV, one former prisoner writes, avoid clicking up or joining a gang. For the most part, the only way out of a gang is dying. One way to help with this is by joining a program. If you can study, study. If you can get books from the prison library, then when will you ever have a better chance to educate yourself? Read and return to society a better man. Another former prisoner on the same forum writes that one word should be remembered in prison, and that is the word respect. That goes for doing things like changing the channel on the TV or even picking up a pair of dumbbells. If in doubt, ask those around you if they are okay with what you're doing. You don't have to sound weak, just polite. Speaking about dumbbells, now's your chance to get in shape. Have a regular workout routine, and with your reading programs, meditation, and working out, you'll leave prison a better person in some ways. All seems to be going well. You have a decent roomie, and you're getting clever and fit. But as philosopher John Paul Sartre once said, hell is other people. You've tried to be respectful, but as one former prisoner put it, the occasional bully will try to push you out of your comfort zone. It's just like high school. Mistakes are a trifle more painful. What should you do in prison if someone steals from you, disrespects you, and tries to physically hurt you? You will have heard on countless TV shows that if you don't attempt to fight back in some situations, that person or other persons might try to hurt you or take advantage of you again. Hell, it's not so bad getting a black eye or a busted lip. You might not win, but fight back. 
Don't ever go looking for trouble, but if you can't get away from it, don't tell the guards and don't just lie down. After one fight, it's usually easier to defend yourself in other fights. This doesn't mean you have to get into fights. Many prisoners serve their sentence without having to scrap. Okay, you're getting continual grief from one person or several people. Do you really have to join a gang? Well, you saw how that turned out for Edward Norton in the movie American History X. The website Inmate Survival writes, Fitting in with society is hard, but to be accepted by your prison mates is even harder. Ouch. The website tells us that of course you'll be identified by your race, whether you're Asian, African American, Spanish, Native American, or Caucasian. Now, as we said, all prisons are different, but even if you're in a place like San Quentin, which is infamous for gangs, you don't necessarily have to join one. On the downside, if you are continually extorted by one, things can get hard for you. How can you avoid not joining a gang if this happens? One former convict with a YouTube channel called Prison Talk explains how this can be done. The host, who spent 10 years in federal prison in the US, tells us, I did my whole bid, I never joined a gang. However, he adds that just to make doing his time better, he did hang out with a certain group he got along with. Prison life can be lonely and scary, so it might be better to join what we might call an unofficial gang. You might just call them friends. He explains that if things turned ugly, he would indeed help those friends and in turn they would help him. If you roll with certain people, you will just have to help them if things take a turn for the worse. This doesn't mean looking for trouble. It's just self-preservation. Prison Talk tells us you do to an extent have to get involved even if you don't want to get involved. It's inevitable. In conclusion, get some friends, but know that those friends might one day need your help. This is life on the streets, in school, and even in the office. But you certainly don't need to join an official gang. Another thing we might add is that before you make friends, know who they are. Find out if they are gang members or even if they are perhaps sketchy. Be smart and take your time when latching onto people. Your reading and the self-awareness you gain from meditation can help with making you a better judge of people. Unfortunately, as many former prisoners will tell you, like life outside of prison, life inside can just be unfair. Yes, you can have a hellish time even if you have done as we said in this show. A researcher at Harvard University tells us prison is a sexual jungle and there are many predators looking for weak prey. The group Stop Prison or Rape says around 200,000 men each year worldwide are raped while doing time. Often, men are treated like animals and they become animals. Others are mean to the core. It's also hard to get help because being a snitch gets you in more trouble. What can you do? Well, sometimes you might not have a choice but to ask to be moved. The Marshall Project even says a good amount of sexual assaults are committed by the guards. So unfortunately, there is no easy way out. One inmate interviewed while in prison said if you appear to be weak and they think they can take advantage of you, that's where things start to go wrong. Another inmate said, don't shower naked, wear your underwear. Another said, staying safe is not snitching. However, if you really have no way out, you just might have to tell. Sometimes, you just can't fight five men at once, no matter how tough you are. Sometimes, you just gotta get away. That said, with friends and a healthy lifestyle and doing all the things we've told you to do, it's unlikely you'll be in this position. Don't think rape is just an everyday thing and that you'll become someone's punk or bitch. Hello, citizens. Welcome to Purge Night. For the next 12 hours, all emergency services will be suspended and all crime is legal. Now it's time to vent all that rage and frustration you've been storing up over the last year. It's time to purge. So you're caught up in the modern dystopia that is the new Founding Fathers of America's version of the good old US of A. And it's March 21st, Purge Night. How do you survive the purge without the benefit of high-powered military weaponry? Is nothing more than a simple, normal, everyday Joe. First, let's recap the history of the purge briefly. Originally started as a grand social experiment on Staten Island by the ruling political party, the New Founding Fathers of America, the purge quickly grew to be a national event, and now every March 21st all crime is legalized for 12 hours of absolute pandemonium and mayhem. But it's not just the everyday citizen getting in on the mass murdering, because in order to keep up casualty figures, Purge Night is routinely supplemented by government kill squads, whose sole purpose it is to murder as many people as possible. But wait, you thought that Purge Night was about people venting their criminal anger and frustration out, so that the rest of the year you could live a peaceful, law-abiding life. Well, no, because it turns out that the new founding fathers of America are less interested in making America a great place to live and more interested in preserving the interests of the rich and powerful. Purge Night's real purpose isn't to help keep American crime down, it's actually to rid the United States of minorities and poor people, hence the government kill squads. So how are you going to survive class warfare in its most literal form? 
First, you have to have a plan for Purge Night. Waltzing into a 12-hour apocalypse is a great way to get yourself killed. So you better have a good plan, with multiple contingencies, to keep you alive. Your plan should include a place to shelter and how to get there in case you're running late on Purge Night and get caught out in the open. You should have both multiple avenues of approach to your shelter as well as multiple avenues of escape in case your shelter is breached. If you're sheltering at home, things like steel plates over windows and thick security doors will help keep out even the most determined purgers. But finding alternative, more secure shelter is probably your best bet. Places like old mine tunnels, abandoned military structures, and even derelict barges floating offshore are the perfect purge shelter. An old mine tunnel might be creepy and dark, but it typically only has one obvious way in with much less obvious escape shafts that could be hundreds or even thousands of feet away. With a single entryway, anyone wanting to purge you won't have the advantage of surprise, as long as you took the time to disguise your escape shafts well. Even better would be places like abandoned military bunkers or even old decommissioned missile silos, although those might be difficult to get into and make usable. Offshore structures means anyone hellbent on purging you is going to have to go through a whole lot of effort just to get to you, and if you're armed, which you should be, then they're going to present a very easy target as they make their way to you. You might simply opt to skip physical shelter altogether and instead just take to the sea on a boat. 12 hours isn't that long, and unless purgers are incredibly motivated to hunt you down, taking off for a half a day at sea is a great way to stay away from the gangs of roving purgers. Of course, another way to survive the purge is to simply be someone people don't want to purge in the first place. Odds are, as you go through the rest of your year, you're at least a little bit selfish or rude to your neighbors and co-workers. In a world with a yearly purge, that's a great way of making sure you have a big fat target on your back come purge night. Instead of being rude or selfish, try to be unselfish and helpful. Mow your neighbor's lawn, let them borrow your car when theirs breaks down, maybe keep your political views to yourself and off your Facebook. Make yourself likable and come purge night, anyone wanting to hurt or kill you is going to find that they have a laundry list of people they want to hurt or kill even more than you. It's only 12 hours after all, so as long as you make sure you're as close to the bottom of that hurt slash kill list as you can possibly get, you'll be fine. During purge night, gangs of roving psychopaths roam the streets looking for easy victims, so the best way to defeat these gangs of roving psychos is to have an even bigger gang of your own. Round up like-minded individuals in the months leading up to purge night and form a neighborhood militia. Even a small group of well-disciplined individuals committed to protecting each other can fend off larger packs of uncoordinated purgers just looking to cause mayhem. But forming a deadly neighborhood watch to survive purge night is only the first step. In the world of national security, the best way to ensure that your facility or your VIP isn't targeted for attack is to discourage an attack in the first place. This is known as becoming a hard target and involves taking steps to ensure that when an attacker sizes you up for a possible attack, they realize that doing so would be too costly, even if successful, to be worth the effort. On purge night, being a hard target might be so effective that you wouldn't be targeted in the first place. After all, if you only have 12 hours to cause mayhem, why waste most of that time going after the neighborhood that's well defended and equipped to protect itself? Better to prey on weaker, more vulnerable people instead. So to become a hard target on purge night, forget going solo and round up that posse of like-minded neighbors, like we said. Against undisciplined bands of roving purgers, just realizing that they'd be going up against a disciplined force might be enough to discourage an attack in the first place. There's likely easier pickings elsewhere anyways, and like we said, the clock is ticking. But being disciplined is key. You don't want to appear like a group of random rabble. Create a uniform for your neighborhood protection force and have every member wear it on purge night. Uniforms mean solidarity, and for roving purgers, it also lets them know that a well-established force is present in the area. Best to move along and look for more vulnerable targets. Next, practice basic self-defense drills together, and if you've got access to them, which you absolutely should in the insane world of the purge, make sure everyone is armed and knows how to use a firearm. Next, you'll want to roll out homemade barricades to shut off vehicle access to your neighborhood, as well as seal off avenues of approach that could be taken on foot. You can do this with physical barriers or by stationing groups of armed guards. Much like the defense of a military installation, you can purposefully leave one very obvious path for attackers to take, and this is where you would funnel anyone wishing to purge you so they can be easily taken out. Set up defensive positions for your guards with crisscrossing fields of fire, and anyone wishing to purge your neighborhood, including government forces, will find the effort is simply not worth it. But what if you're forced to go solo? Well, your best bet is to hide. Get out of the city, flee to the countryside, and take to the hills. Park your car somewhere remote, then take off on foot, pushing deeper and deeper into the wild. 
Ideally, you would have begun your camping trip well before purge night and made sure that your ultimate destination required multiple modes of travel to get there, like parking your car at the end of a dirt road somewhere, then taking a boat ride, and then hiking to reach your final destination. The United States has a great deal of truly wild places, and you can survive purge night by hiding out with Bigfoot. Of course, the best way to survive the purge, though, is to make sure you aren't purgeable to begin with. Like we said in our recap of purge history, the entire event is basically an excuse for rich people to kill off poor people. So to survive purge night, just be rich. The wealthy and powerful are not just in many cases the most horrific proponents of violence on purge night, but are basically immune to being purged themselves thanks to their massive resources. Elite security agents, intruder-proof safe rooms, and homes that double as military fortresses all make being rich during purge night the best way to stay safe. Though you'd still have to watch out for your fellow one percenter who loves nothing more than to play their sick sadistic games of revenge and torture on each other come purge night. If you're financially challenged, then good news because there's still a chance to make yourself untouchable come purge night. The America of the purge is still sort of a democracy, so simply run for a high enough government office and you can be classified a level 10 government employee, which is still illegal to kill on purge night. The government still needs to operate post-purge after all. And if all of our political differences could be settled with mass murder, well, at least Facebook would be a lot quieter place. Alright, you're not rich, and you're not likable enough to get elected. Matter of fact, you're not likable enough to not get purged. And you know that that kid you cut off at the green light a week ago is definitely going to be looking to get all purgy on you come purge night. Your home is kind of indefensible because you can't afford the fancy security systems other people can and you don't have access to a whole cache of weapons. What are you going to do? Often the best place to hide isn't where people won't go looking but where they don't want to go looking. We're talking about the worst places you can imagine spending 12 hours in. Places that no human being in their right mind would ever enter. Like a T-Mobile store. Not as good as a T-Mobile store, but close, would be a sewage treatment plant, even a rancid landfill. These are places people avoid in their normal lives, and for someone to hunt you down in one of these disgusting locations, they're going to have to be really extra motivated. Become one with the filth. Dig in deep to a pile of fresh trash or camp out next to a large sewage holding pond. These places are going to smell so disgusting that very few people are going to even think about looking for victims in a place they themselves would never willingly go. Of course, you can also opt to wait out the purge in places that are just incredibly unlikely to be targeted by purgers, places like a local library. Think about it, what psychopath purger is going to even consider for a second to check a local library for victims or anything worth stealing? You'll naturally want to avoid hiding out in places that could attract looters. After all, every crime is legal come purge night, and a bunch of people are just going to be looking for free loot. But who in the world is going to be breaking into a library looking for things to steal? The best way to avoid purge night, though, is just to leave the country altogether. You don't even have to be rich to do it. Just hop in a car and drive either north or south until you hit the Canadian or Mexican border. It'll take you a couple of tanks of gas and a day road trip, but you can plan out a long weekend for yourself and sit in a crappy Canadian motel room eating poutine and watching America burn itself to the ground on TV, just like the real Founding Fathers would have wanted. There are an estimated 110 million landmines left in the world unexploded and just waiting for the wrong person to wander by. Sometimes even decades after the conflict that saw them laid down is over. Mines don't discriminate and kill long after the fighting has stopped. They're difficult to detect, even more difficult to safely clear out, and often their presence alone simply forces people to abandon entire towns and villages. In Afghanistan, some areas of the country have been mined so frequently by different powers that the mines lay in layers, like geological layers of the earth. And in the former Yugoslavia, you can still find mines disguised as children's toys along stream banks, with soldiers releasing them by the dozens into the fast-flowing waters so they would kill and maim their enemies downstream. If you're a world traveler, there's always the risk of stepping off the beaten path and into a literal danger zone. And today, we're going to find out how you can get yourself out of a minefield. Mines come in a variety of different types. Some are designed to destroy vehicles and others are meant to kill or maim personnel. In combat, a wounded enemy is better than a dead enemy because the casualty will force other soldiers to risk their lives to save their comrade. Thus, many anti-personnel mines aren't made to outright kill an individual, but rather just to simply maim them. Anti-vehicle mines are designed to take out heavy trucks, tanks, and you could stand on top of one or even do jumping jacks and never set it off. Even more sinister, some mines are designed to detonate only on the second or third activation, 
thus killing or wounding soldiers who travel along paths thought safe from mines. Generally speaking, mines come in two varieties. Anti-vehicle mines direct an upward explosive blast meant to penetrate the soft underside of a vehicle, while anti-personnel mines explode and generate a great deal of shrapnel so as to inflict maximum injury. Some mines, such as the American Claymore mine, are set up above ground, but most mines are buried by dirt layers so as to make them more difficult to spot. Modern mines can be deployed by aircraft, and some are even able to self-bury in loose soil a few inches. Other mines, typically those employed by terrorist or asymmetrical forces, are a little more than disguised IEDs, and historically these have taken the form of children's toys or objects that appear valuable. These are designed to kill and wound civilian populations rather than military personnel, and are particularly insidious in their design. The average mine responds to downward pressure, triggering off a pound per square inch sensitivity limit that is preset by the manufacturer or the mine layer. Some modern mines can have their sensitivity adjusted so that they only respond to greater amounts of pressure. This way, they avoid being detonated by small animals or children and will instead detonate when a soldier steps on them. Most mines simply detonate their explosive while on the ground, while others contain a small amount of explosive charge which boosts the mine up into the air before a secondary explosion in the main body showers the area in lethal shrapnel. The infamous German S-mine or Bouncing Betty from World War II is the best example of one of these self-elevating mines and proved to be wickedly effective at causing mass casualties. These mines generally achieved a lower absolute kill count but instead achieved a far greater casualty count, and often this is the preferred outcome. In combat, it's better to wound many enemies than kill a few, as it will lower the amount of firepower your enemy can bring to bear and force him to divert resources to care for the wounded. So what could you do if you found yourself stuck in the middle of a minefield? How could you get out and survive with most of your limbs intact? First is the most obvious, turn around and retrace your steps, making sure that you step exactly in the same spot you did when you were blindly walking into the minefield. This is, of course, not a foolproof strategy. As mentioned before, some mines are designed to detonate only on the second activation. And so, just because you didn't blow up the first time you wandered into the minefield, it's no guarantee you won't blow yourself to bits on the way out. The best thing to do is to stand absolutely still and call for help. If you wandered into a minefield, then there's probably a good chance that there's someone in the local area whose job it is to clear mines. Let's say you're all alone, though, and simply staying put is not an option. Well, we're not going to lie to you. Getting out of an active minefield alive or with all four limbs intact is going to be a pretty slim proposition. Despite what you may have seen in the movies, it takes trained experts many, many days to successfully clear even just a small portion of a minefield. You, on your own, are probably not going to fare so well. If you've got no other options though, well, you could try and mark your own way out from the minefield. You've probably seen it on TV, a soldier crawling on his belly, feeling the dirt in front of him with his knife for mines, and marking off when his trusty knife clinks into one just below the surface. Well, it's better than nothing, but in all likelihood, this is probably still going to get you killed. However, probably is a better bet than definitely, so go get your trusty knife, or find yourself a nice long and thin branch that's hopefully within arm's reach. Now, mines respond to downwards pressure, so if you prod into the dirt in front of you at a 45 degree angle and make sure you do it nice and easy, you have a decent chance of not setting off the mine you eventually prod into. If possible, you instead want to slowly prod the dirt in front of you with your stick to a depth of about a foot, and then if you hit nothing, move your stick while still buried in all four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. You ideally want to bump into a mine from the side while your stick is still buried because even coming down on a mine at a 45 degree angle can be fatal. You should be able to feel a pretty firm resistance from a mine when your buried stick bumps into it, and trying to move your stick gently along the edges of it will let you know if you've truly hit a mine or just a rock. This is going to be an incredibly slow and painstaking work. Remember how we told you that it takes professionals days to clear a small minefield? You're going to want to keep clearing the dirt in front of you inches at a time. Every time you sink your probe into the dirt, try to move it about 2 inches in each direction. Then if all clear, move 4 inches to the left or right of where you were and do it again. Once you've cleared half a foot or so laterally in front of you, move your probe 4 inches ahead of you and do it all over again. Think of it like a typewriter and you're clearing the ground in front of you row by row. 
Once you've cleared a few feet like this, you have to make a decision. How badly do you need to get out of this minefield? Are you injured and in need of medical attention? Are you in some kind of danger, other than, you know, blowing up at any second from buried mines? If you need to beat a hasty retreat out of the minefield, you can use a technique to attempt to clear a path in front of you after you've cleared out a few feet with your probe. First, you're going to want to lower yourself to the ground in the area you've cleared. Then take something heavy, as heavy as you can find, and prepare to throw it ahead of you. This works best if you have a rope you can use to throw it far and then pull it toward you, dragging out a path which should detonate any buried mines. You'll want to lay on the area of ground you've cleared with your feet toward the direction you're throwing your pack, because your head is more important than your feet, and you'll want to protect it from any exploding shrapnel. By staying low, you'll avoid much of the shrapnel flying through the air as the mine explodes outwards, and should avoid the majority of the worst effects of a self-elevating mine, such as the infamous Bouncing Betty. So hopefully you have a backpack and a length of rope because you're going to throw that backpack as far as you can ahead of you and quickly lay down with your feet toward the backpack. Then simply drag the backpack toward you and hopefully set off any mines in your way. Remember, though, not all mines go off on the first activation, so repeat this process a few times if nothing goes off. After the third or fourth time, you got yourself a path that is maybe clear of mines. We have to stress that in no way is this technique perfect, but it beats dying of exposure or of your wounds if stuck in a minefield. The sad truth is that outside of specialized equipment, even the best trained and armed soldiers in the world can do little to save themselves when stuck in a minefield. Odds are then that you, with no training and no equipment, are probably going to fare much worse. The techniques we highlighted in this video are in no way perfect, but if push comes to shove, they are the best chance you've got of making it out alive from a very terrible situation. It's here! The zombie apocalypse at last! Luckily, you've been keeping yourself informed and up to date on zombie threats and zombie survival strategies because you're one smart cookie that subscribes to the infographic show, so you're better prepared than most people. Maybe there was a biological outbreak of brain-infecting mold, or evil magicians have summoned forth the walking dead to stalk the earth. Or maybe it's just another episode of The Mandalorian, and now hordes of mindless baby Yoda fans are trying to convince you that it's actually a good show. Either way, thanks to your frequent viewing of our show, you're already prepared as we've already covered all these situations and more. This time though, we're not going to advise you to head for the hills as we usually do, because this time it's a fight to the death. It's you versus a thousand walking, shambling corpses, all hell bent on eating your brains like space aliens from Zeti Reticuli. How are you going to defeat the Horde? Your battlefield for this fight will be the average American city, which means there will be plenty of resources at your disposal in your one-man war against the Walking Dead. First, though, we must know our enemy. The zombie as we know it has its origins in Caribbean voodoo practices, with voodoo practitioners claiming to have the power to create real-life zombies. Modern science has discovered that there might be some terrifying truth to this tale, though. In 1980, a researcher named Wade Davis discovered that voodoo practitioners would often powder a neurotoxin found in the pufferfish and other animals called tetrodotoxin. The powder could severely impair brain function and leave an individual in a zombie-like state, although it would require a very precise amount that many scientists were skeptical a voodoo practitioner could accurately measure. Too little and the effect would be incomplete, too much and it would be lethal. One man at least is convinced of the validity of zombies, and that's Haitian Clairvius Narcisse. He was declared dead only to return home 18 years later, very much not dead. Researchers believe that Narcisse was given a mixture of tetrodotoxin and bufotoxin, which put him in a coma and made it appear as if he was dead. His family thus buried him and after mourners left, voodoo witches known as Bokor returned and dug him up, then put him to work on a sugar plantation as a mindless slave. He was fed a constant diet of this powerful drug mixture, keeping him in a perpetual zombie state until finally one day the owner of the plantation died and his drugging ended. The zombies we're putting you up against, though, aren't drug-addled innocent victims. Or maybe they are. Does it really matter? They definitely want your brains, and right now, the point of them being alive or dead is pretty much moot. A zombie's mindlessness can be its weakness, making it easy to outmaneuver and lure into traps and ambushes. But it's also its strength, and we mean that literally. Some scientists believe that our brains regulate our own strength so that we don't inadvertently hurt ourselves by overexerting our muscles and perhaps doing things like ripping them from the bone. 
For a zombie though, there's no higher mental processes going on, so this lack of a regulator is believed to be the source of a zombie's incredible strength. In other words, you're gonna want to stay out of hand-to-hand -hand combat with a zombie or it'll literally tear you to ribbons. Luckily though, most zombies are fairly slow despite what some television shows would have you believe. That's simply because when the body dies it begins to decompose, and while the zombie's curse keeps the worst parts of decomposition at bay, much of the body still atrophies and stiffens. Imagine trying to run with two bad charley horses, that's pretty much how impossible it is for a zombie to move quickly. What they lack for in mobility though they more than make up for in numbers, and today you're going up against a whopping 1,000 of them. Before we teach you how to defend yourself, we need to talk zombie biology. There's been much talk about how to permanently put a zombie down. And while the fabled headshot seems to be the hands down favorite, we have serious problems with that. First, hitting a moving target the size of a basketball isn't going to be easy, even if it is slowly shambling along. There's a reason why police and military are taught to aim center mass and not go for a cool Call of Duty headshot no scope. That might be impressive in the digital world, but in the real world, it's a great way to get yourself killed. The thing about a zombie is that it still has a skeleton, and like any vertebrate animal, it very much needs that skeleton in order to stay upright. The bones provide a foundation for the muscles to work with and keep you standing on two feet. Start removing or breaking bones and you very quickly collapse into a pile of zombie bait, only able to shuffle forward a few feet in a pathetic crawl. For any zombie out there, this is also true. Snap some femurs or break a zombie's back, and that zombie is going to drop faster than a terrible Star Wars film. Break a zombie's neck and wish it good luck trying to bite you when it can't even keep its head up. So don't worry too much about headshots, instead keep the tried and true tactic of aiming center mass. Alright, let's talk weapons. First, you're going to want an option for close-in one-on-one kills. The typical favorite here is the katana, because who doesn't want to be a badass apocalypse street samurai? Well, nobody who wants to stay alive, that's who. Katanas may look awesome, but they're pretty terrible zombie weapons. Firstly, you're probably using the katana wrong. You're not supposed to swing the blade with all your might the way you would a European sword. You're actually supposed to flick your wrist for killing strikes, similar to fly fishing. Secondly, katanas were made more for slashing strikes that could bleed an opponent to death. And zombies are notoriously immune to bleeding to death, by virtue of already being dead. We hate to ruin your weebo fantasy of becoming a post-apocalyptic samurai master, but you're going to want to stick with a good old axe instead of some fancy katana you'll likely just end up slicing yourself with. Axes are solid, heavy, and can bring a combination of cutting and smashing force down on an opponent, making them perfect for destroying zombie bodies. Another good choice would be something similar to a medieval morning star, which can deliver terrifying amounts of crushing power in one blow. Morning stars were actually the preferred weapon of conscript armies during the medieval ages as they required no skill to wield and could devastate even knights in plate armor. Remember, you're not going to be able to bleed a zombie to death, but if you smash bones, that zombie will be left a crawling mess and you can easily step over it in no time at all. Alright, maces and axes are great, but as long as you can find ammo for it, little is going to beat a Mossberg Street Sweeper for close quarters zombie combat. You've probably seen it countless times in shows. The main character gets themselves a shotgun and then saws the front off of it for the legendary sawed off shotgun. Is there more an iconic post apocalyptic weapon? Maybe the chainsaw, and even then, only wielded by a time traveling S Mart clerk missing a hand. Here's the thing though leave that barrel exactly where it's at, or at most saw it off only a few inches. You want your shotgun to be versatile and still be able to peg a target at a moderate range while providing massive firepower at close quarters. If you saw the barrel off too, short, the pellets in the shotgun round are going to spread far too wide to do much good against a zombie. Remember, you need to cause massive physical destruction to a zombie's body, not just shower it with shotgun pellets. Keeping a tight spread will deliver horrifying amounts of kinetic energy to a small area, effectively turning your shotgun into a zombie disintegration cannon. Now we're going to be looking at how to kill groups of zombies at a time. Luckily for you, you're fighting in a modern city, which means one thing there's plenty of supplies to scavenge. When it comes to taking out groups of zombies, nothing's better than a homemade grenade. Except for, you know, a real grenade. Anyway, the first thing you want to do is find yourself some fireworks, which may or may not be that difficult, depending on your local county regulations. If you can't find fireworks, then simple sparklers will do. If fireworks are not legal in your county though, then don't despair, because remember, this is America. Fireworks may be illegal in many places due to safety concerns, but bullets definitely aren't. So get yourself some bullets and simply pry them apart. Whether using fireworks or bullets, what you're going to get at is the powder inside. That black stuff inside a bullet casing isn't pepper, it's gunpowder, and it's what makes guns work. You'll want to get yourself a good amount of the stuff and set it aside. 
Next, start collecting aerosol cans and tin foil. You'll want to pack gunpowder into the curved bottom of an aerosol can, and then use a piece of string soaked with lighter fluid and run it from the gunpowder up the side of the can. Use tin foil to keep the whole thing together, and you should be left with a tin foil wrapped aerosol can that has a fuse sticking out of it. Now simply light the fuse and run for your life, because homemade explosives are incredibly unpredictable, which by the way is exactly why you should never try this at home. If you can find a medical supply store, though, you can enhance your zombie busting grenades by including a small can of liquid nitrogen in your packaging. <laughs> the explosive blast of the aerosol can bursting will spray liquid nitrogen in a large area and slow down incoming zombies even more, giving you plenty of time to finish them off. With your homemade grenades, you can probably thin the crowd of zombies substantially, but it's going to be a protracted hit and run war. You'll be wanting to stick to the high ground because zombies are notoriously poor climbers, and prepare even bigger and better explosions because seriously, a thousand zombies is a lot of zombies to kill as just one man or woman. To start taking out large groups of zombies, you'll want to start getting creative or at least mobile. It's time to pimp your zombie apocalypse ride because the end of the world is here and we're going riding for one last time. Pick a heavy duty truck of some kind, ideally something with four wheel drive, and an extended cab for vital supplies. Then you'll want to start affixing all kinds of pointy sharp nasty bits to the front of it. You can take lengths of pipe and shear the end off at an angle to make homemade spikes. Simply affix it to the front of your death mobile with the help of metal wire ties or a whole lot of tape. Maybe throw in some saw blades while you're at it. Though you'll want them perpendicular to the ground so they slice through zombies being run over by your zombie killing death wagon. You'll need to protect the tires though, so we recommend you take the time to affix mud flaps to each tire. Only place them in front of the tire rather than behind. That way any zombie getting run over will be forced down by the mud flap and hopefully avoid puncturing your tire inadvertently. Listen, this next part is easy. All you have to do is ride now, just take a cruise up and down your city's blocks, mowing down zombies like it was going out of style, because pretty soon it will be. To make sure your vehicle doesn't get stuck in all the gore, just snap some cold weather chains onto your tires to give you traction even in the slickest, most zombie guts filled streets. At this point, you'll just have to avoid getting jumped while going to and from your zombie killing death wagon, because once you're inside that bad boy, there's nothing The Walking Dead can do to stop you from winning this epic matchup. It's finally happened. The world's gone all topsy-turvy and the leaders of the world have decided enough's enough. It's time to settle every score on the book in one major titanic brawl. Winner take all. It's East versus West, North versus South, Capitalism versus Communism, fanboys who think The Mandalorian was a good show versus people with actual good taste in television. The gloves are off and the world is at war once more. Luckily for you though, you're one smart cookie, and you subscribe to The Infographic Show, the internet's best resource for cataclysm survival stories, awesome challenges, and more than a fair bit of informative sass. Thanks to your excellent viewing habits, you're better prepared than most to survive the end of the world. Basically, you're a pre-order customer for Fallout 76 and are getting a one-week head start on the Armageddon over everybody else, if of course Fallout 76 wasn't literally the worst video game ever created and nobody who likes fun should ever play it. To survive the end of days, you're going to have to be prepared and be ready to respond even before the end officially starts. So what in the world should you be on the lookout for before you pack your bags and join in the world's biggest Fallout LARP event? If not dying in radioactive fire is on your top 10 list of favorite things, then good news because despite what the disaster hungry media might be screaming at you every day over the TV, internet, Facebook and even the sad half dozen of you that still use LiveJournal.com, the truth is that the world is more peaceful than ever. Now just because the world is more peaceful than it's ever been doesn't mean that there's no conflict or even a lot of them. So pump the brakes on blowing up our comment section for a sec and hang in there with us. Violence has been on the decline across the spate of human history. Though it's only in the last century that we've seen significant progress towards turning the earth into one giant hippie commune. Simply put, we as individuals are more adverse to violence than we have ever been in our history. In the 16th century, France's idea of public wholesome family entertainment was to gather the community together for a good old fashioned cat burning, where a cat was tied to a rope and then slowly lowered into a roaring fire. The cat would shriek in pain until it finally died, and all the while the gathered crowd would roar with laughter. If you think this type of entertainment was limited to the lower classes by the way, you'd be wrong as it was all the rage amongst the aristocracy as well. Today though, no sane person would think that lowering an animal into a raging fire was good entertainment. In fact, that person would be harshly punished by law enforcement nearly anywhere in the world. 
As societies, we've come to abhor violence and actively work to prevent it or avoid it whenever possible, or at least limit its impact. Small-scale conflicts are still common throughout the world, but only in the less developed parts. The developed nations of the world are almost universally stable and peaceful, something which would have blown the pantaloons straight off your cat-burning 16th century ancestor. For them, a world without the constant threat of a major war existed only in fiction. For your average first and second worlder, the only war they experience is the endless flame wars that rage across the comment section of anything, literally anything posted online. Because someone somewhere always hates you and what you have to say. At least today they just call you names instead of bashing you over the head with a rock. Despite the relatively peaceful state of the world though, there is still a serious risk for World War III and that risk is concentrated among several potential flashpoints. The top three are an Eastern European confrontation with Russia, a confrontation with China in the South China Sea, and a confrontation with China over Taiwan. A confrontation with Russia in Eastern Europe would likely be the result of further Russian aggression against Ukraine, which could trigger a retaliatory response from NATO, despite the fact that Ukraine is not a NATO member. This is unlikely though, as Russia has no appetite for a major war, though the fact that Ukraine is determined to become a NATO member by 2040 certainly ramps up the risk of war. A more likely scenario for a third global war would be a confrontation between the US and China in the South Pacific or Taiwan. The US has repeatedly affirmed its commitment to defend Taiwan from China, and for China allowing Taiwan to remain free and independent is an ongoing national embarrassment that the Chinese Communist Party may not be willing to tolerate for very long. China will never be taken seriously as a global military power if it can't even retake a single island right off its own shores. So let's say it happened and the US and China started shooting at each other and Russia decided screw it it's cold in Siberia and we're bored, time to kick off World War III. How in the world are you going to survive? If World War III goes nuclear right away, then sorry, you're not surviving. That's it. Video over. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the nearest vault. That might sound a bit defeatist, but when we're trying to show you how to survive, we're hoping we can give you a game plan that will keep you alive for a few decades, not a month or two before you starve to death or become an irradiated corpse. In the case of a full nuclear release, the first weapons will be impacting within 15 minutes depending on where you live, meaning you have exactly zero time to get to safety with enough supplies to last you. We hear you Billy Bob and Ray J. Well I live me in the country, I ain't no soft snowflake like you city folk. Alright there Deliverance, hold on to your suspenders, because we got bad news for you. You're dead too and all your wilderness survival skills or YouTube prepper subscriptions aren't going to do you a lick of good. You may survive the initial volley that targets major population centers, but what you won't survive are the secondary volleys which specifically target major water supplies and arable land. A full nuclear exchange is designed to not just militarily or economically defeat an opponent, but to completely obliterate a nation from the face of the earth and ensure its people cannot survive. Radiation-rich weapons can irradiate vast swaths of territory and make water undrinkable and farmland unworkable for decades. Your only hope of surviving World War III and perhaps living to the ripe old age of 40 is if the war is a slow burn that doesn't immediately turn nuclear. If you're an American, Canadian, or Mexican then congratulations because you won the geography lottery and for the first few months of the war the only noticeable effect will be a seriously slumping economy. With two huge oceans on either coast, no enemy on Earth can breach the geographic barrier that protects North America. In our US vs the World video, we showed you how the US Navy is big enough to fight all the world's navies combined to a standstill, and the world doesn't have enough transport capacity to actually get troops to North America. That means that all the fighting will be overseas, which gives overprivileged North Americans lots of time to prep their shelter for the end of the world. If you're Asian or European, you're screwed. Not only will most of the fighting be happening on one or both of these continents, but they will be the hardest hit economically by a third world war. While North American countries can still trade with themselves and even South America, war-torn Asia and Europe wouldn't have that option. To make matters even better, the first nuclear weapons that fall will be in these places. This will likely come in the form of small-scale tactical nuclear strikes which inevitably will be escalated to a full nuclear exchange. If war breaks out in Europe, the best thing you can do is get as far west as you possibly can. The Great European Plain spans across Eastern Europe and reaches into the northern half of Western Europe. Historically this plain has been all but undefendable and no nation has suffered more for it than Russia. 
Thanks to the vast European plain with little defensive features, Russia has been repeatedly invaded by other European powers for the last several hundred years. Historically, major powers have fought to expand their influence across the European plain. The further into the plain they could push their boundaries or influence, the deeper they could stage their forces. This meant that they could then launch an attack against a neighboring power using any number of different avenues, and the defender would be spread perilously thin trying to cover them all. The European plain is the single greatest reason for why Russia has historically fought to push its influence westward, especially after suffering so terribly at the hands of invaders. If war were to break out between NATO and Russia, Russia would immediately launch a series of tactical nuclear strikes, not against actual military targets, but rather into the territory of the Great Plain itself. By irradiating the land, Russia would force NATO to funnel its forces into fewer and fewer avenues of attack, giving the Russian military a chance to stop NATO cold in its tracks. For NATO's part, they would be doing all they can to spread out across the plain and to push into Russian territory across many different fronts. One can quickly see how the European plain is a tactical disaster for the Russian military, and why NATO's expansion on its borders angers Russia so much. By heading west, you'll avoid most of the initial fighting and the effects of the tactical nuclear strikes by Russia meant to funnel NATO forces into defensive corridors. A single miscalculation by Russia, though, whom has already publicly declared it would use nuclear weapons in a first strike capability against NATO forces, would quickly escalate the conflict. And soon, major European cities would be the target of nuclear strikes. The safest bet for Europeans would be to simply leave the continent altogether. The best hope would be found by crossing the Mediterranean into Africa and into the Middle East, where there are few military or economic targets for nuclear strikes. In a complete reverse of the recent refugee crisis, this time it would be the Europeans flooding African and Middle Eastern nations seeking asylum. Good thing you guys have been treating your asylum seekers so well, right? For our Asian viewers, the good news is that as long as you don't live in China, India, or Pakistan, there's few valid military or economic targets for a nuclear strike. While most Asian nations favor the US and the West, few of them are allied close enough with the United States to warrant having a Chinese nuclear weapon lobbed their way. For the Chinese, well, aside from Pakistan, nobody is really China's friend on the world stage, at least not friend enough to join it in a war against the US. Most people would be tempted to flee to Australia, thinking themselves safe in the land down under, except Australia is a resolute ally of the United States and on really bad terms with China. Tensions between Australia and China only became worse with the recent defection of a Chinese intelligence official to Australia, which provided information on covert and espionage action against Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Australia. Then there's also the fact that the United States and Australia jointly operate several key military facilities which would be critical in a war against China, meaning it's time to say goodbye to Australia and its 10 million venomous animals because nuclear attacks against that nation is guaranteed. Instead, Asian survivors should seek to leave populated areas behind and return to the countryside. With so much of Asia still living an agrarian lifestyle, the region may perhaps be the best suited for surviving a full-blown apocalypse, or at least for the first few months. Once widespread debris from a global nuclear war has brought about nuclear winter, then the crops will begin to fail all around the world, though it will be the rainforest areas of Asia that are hit first and hardest. Crops there are especially vulnerable to cold, especially rice, which is a staple crop for billions of people. Luckily, a lot of the initial predictions for a nuclear winter have in time been discovered to be overblown. Instead of the freezing cold nuclear winter of old, the world would most likely experience a nuclear autumn with a drop of 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. That would drop a balmy summer day of 75 degrees Fahrenheit to 57 degrees. Sadly, that's far out of the tolerance range for most major crops, and what crops did survive, such as wheat, would be in extremely low yields. Mankind would starve to death as crops wither and animals die. To make matters worse, giant dust storms would constantly spread irradiated material across the globe, making the air itself deadly to breathe. It's highly unlikely that all of humanity would die, but most would, and the reality is that the few survivors that did make it would probably not be able to kickstart the human race before a natural extinction event simply took them out. Maybe if you happen to be a Bigfoot with internet access watching our videos, you might survive. But for the rest of us though, it's lights out. It's another wonderful day in the neighborhood. Well, minus the fact that your entire city is on lockdown because Umbrella, the biggest employer in your city, suffered some kind of chemical spill. As a safety precaution, everyone's just been sent a text ordering them to stay indoors. 
You sigh aloud and toss your phone. Really, not what you need right now, when you suddenly hear a scream. You rush to the window and you can't believe your eyes as you watch a lady trying to walk her dog get tackled by a person? No, it's not really a person, its skin is all wrong. And you've definitely never seen a person have a tongue that long before. As the kindly old lady gets butchered in front of you, you realize that maybe your neighbor wasn't so crazy to stash away a freedom arsenal after all. The government's definitely not coming for anyone's guns, but the streets are very quickly filling up with zombies and freakish mutants coming for your limbs and major organs. So you're stuck inside ground zero of yet another one of Umbrella's accidental T-virus releases. Seriously, how is this company still around? A single major chemical spill is enough to have the EPA crush a normal company into oblivion. Well, logical plot holes aside, how are you going to survive the T-virus? The T-virus has its origins in a very secluded location in Africa where it was discovered growing alongside a unique species of flower. The virus was quickly moved into research labs across America and Europe and experimented on by the Umbrella Corporation, basically the T-Mobile of the Resident Evil franchise but with better reception. Much to the surprise of Umbrella's researchers, the virus showed incredible mutagenic properties. Soon the virus was engineered to carry genetic code from one organism and then insert that code directly into the DNA of an infected host. The virus could also edit host DNA to better accept donor DNA and to tailor an infected host's DNA as Umbrella saw fit. In essence, the virus worked as a piggyback agent that could merge DNA from two organisms together to create a brand new life form because two is better than one. The T-virus could have easily been used to alter the DNA of humans with that of cancer or disease-resistant organisms, thereby making all other medicine obsolete forever and making Umbrella the richest corporation in existence. Instead, the company decided it would be a better idea idea to use the virus to create hordes of monsters to use as bioweapons, which were extremely dangerous, could not be controlled in any way, and often broke free to wreak havoc on umbrella installations. It was a foolproof plan. Shockingly, instead of making trillions of dollars off their modified virus, it broke free, like 10 times, and basically ruined umbrella while almost bringing around the end of the world. But now it's your problem because the T-virus is knocking on your door. So how are you going to survive it? First, as with any major pandemic, and as many people are currently finding out, the best way to avoid infection is to practice social distancing. In essence, by staying away from other humans, you limit the infection vectors of a disease by not giving it the opportunity to jump hosts. The disease then infects a host and, with no other vectors to infect, ends up dying, sometimes along with the host, before it can reproduce and spread. Sadly, the horde of flesh-eating zombies and monsters with uncomfortably long, razor-sharp tongues beating down your door are making social distancing a bit difficult. Unlike most viruses that can be treated with social distancing and die with their host, some versions of the T-virus can actually use the host to spread by increasing their aggressiveness to animalistic levels and then transmitting to new hosts via bites and scratches delivered by the infected host. Your best bet for survival is to take your social distancing to pretty extreme levels and leave cities as far behind as you can get. We're pretty fond of heading to the mountains in the case of just about any major apocalyptic event, and you've no doubt discovered by now if you're a longtime fan of the show, there's a reason for that. Mountains can be difficult to survive in, but that's kind of the point. The rugged terrain and the weather will keep other people from trying to follow you, and in any virus outbreak, people equal bad. But it's not just people you'll be keeping away from in a T-virus outbreak. It's all types of zombies and monsters as well who aren't going to be keen on following you up a mountainside. Why bother when cities are densely packed with delicious, gooey, cream-filled humans running around in a state of panic? We know we said just a moment ago that people equal bad in a virus outbreak, but in this case, people might be the best thing for you because they're going to make for great diversions as they get themselves eaten. Of course, keeping yourself from getting eaten in the first place is going to be its own challenge, so so it's time to enforce social distancing with guns. We chatted with our resident military vet, and he told us the following about surviving in a post-apocalyptic T-virus landscape. Getting yourself a gun is a no-brainer, but the question is which gun to get. Well, this is going to make a lot of gun nerds pretty mad, but the truth is you want to stay away from anything resembling an assault rifle. Thing is, they make terrible home defense weapons anyway, as they're so high-powered that a round is just as likely to kill an intruder as it is to punch a hole through the wall and kill your family hiding on the other side of it. Seriously, I can't stress this enough. Walls don't stop rifle bullets. Instead, get yourself a solid shotgun. Shotguns are great in home defense scenarios or apocalyptic scenarios as they're super simple to learn how to operate, so if something happens to your family, you can easily pick it up and put a bad guy or a mutant freak down, unlike with an assault rifle. Also, they don't require the same high degree of accuracy 
accuracy that an assault rifle does, which is why it's far better for home defense. In a nighttime home invasion, all you have to do is aim your shotgun in the general direction of a bad guy and he's going to have a really bad day. Same goes for a blood-hungry zombie freak. If you're in a post-apocalyptic scenario with mutants chasing you down, the last thing you want to do is get into a stand-up fight in the middle of a packed city or have to stop to carefully aim your weapon. You want to run and gun, always working toward fleeing your situation. When you're panicked in a survival situation, unless you're a disciplined shooter, a shotgun is always going to serve you better. Plus, they deliver far more stopping power at a close range than any rifle, completely obliterating anything made of flesh and bone within 20 feet of your position. I know everyone thinks they'd be the ultimate apocalypse badass, but I've seen even well-trained troops freeze up and break down in a fight-or-flight situation. I'm not saying assault rifles aren't good, by the way, I just wouldn't want one personally in a home invasion or in fighting my way out of a T-virus infected city, unless I guess the mutants could somehow shoot back at you from range. The question though is what kind of shotgun to get? Well, you've got two real choices here, semi-automatic or pump action. The only real difference between the two is that semi-auto shotguns will automatically load the next round into the chamber for you, so all you really have to do is keep your sights on the target and squeeze the trigger. A pump action shotgun is exactly like it sounds, you have to pump the rounds into the chamber manually. Personally, I prefer a pump action shotgun in a combat or a doomsday scenario simply because it eliminates mechanical complexity by getting rid of the feeding mechanism and is thus far more reliable. As anyone who fires hundreds of rounds at a time in a very stressful situation can tell you, even the most reliable automatic weapons will eventually experience a malfunction. I'd rather not risk it, and while a pump action is going to be slower to fire, it's far more reliable. Plus, again, these things will absolutely obliterate anything stupid enough to stand in front of it. Alright, so it looks like our resident vet has a clear favorite on zombie destruction tools. But there's more to surviving a T-virus outbreak than just weapons. Doesn't matter if you exterminate every zombie or mutant freak that comes in your way if you end up succumbing to infection later anyway. For that reason, one key piece of equipment we'd recommend you pick up is a face shield of the same style used by doctors. We guess you could go for a more badass post-apocalyptic look and pick up a welding mask or something similar. But whatever you get, it should provide protection to your face holes from dangerous splashback. Living bodies tend to pop like overripe tomatoes when facing the wrath of a 10 or 12 gauge shotgun, and you want to keep all that infectious blood and guts from getting into your mouth or eyes, two common transmission vectors. Ultimately though, you're going to probably cross paths with the most dangerous form of the T-virus, the tyrants. These are superhuman creatures with greatly enhanced strength and endurance, as well as an incredible regenerative factor that makes them virtually impervious to all gunfire. While the best bet is to flee from those monsters, the truth is that they are nearly tireless with incredible endurance and can crash straight through walls to get to their prey. And because they are created to hunt down humans, you are very much their prey. You're going to have to fight, but how? Forget bullets, it's time to seriously upgrade your firepower. Sure, it would be nice to come across a piece of discarded high-powered military equipment, but that type of firepower is going to be in very short supply come the apocalypse. Plus, learning how to operate a recoilless rifle or something similar isn't something you can just learn on the spot. Instead, you'll have to improvise, and while regeneration makes tyrants virtually immune to gunfire, no amount of regeneration can stop fire. While high-powered firearms deliver great shearing and tearing forces to the flesh, fire can destroyed at the molecular level, reducing it to lifeless ash. Problem is that tyrants have such an incredible ability to regenerate that you have to ensure a significant amount of their flesh is destroyed in order to stop the regeneration completely. Napalm is both easy to make and extremely difficult to extinguish, while burning at incredibly high temperatures. While in this scenario it wouldn't be as effective as white phosphorus, such as that used in military weapons, it'll more than make do in a pinch against a rampaging tyrant. All you'll need is a healthy amount of gasoline or diesel fluid and styrofoam, which will create a very sticky, extremely flammable fuel which burns for a long time. Tyrants aren't particularly bright and extremely single-minded in their purpose, so luring one into a napalm trap should be extremely easy. Once on fire, you have to make sure the tyrant burns long enough to destroy most of its soft tissues. The best way to do this will be to slow it down, and the best way to do that is to use your handy dandy shotgun and blow away its kneecaps. Sure, normally the tyrant will be able to heal in a matter of minutes and keep coming after you, but once you've dropped him on his face by taking out his knees, all you have to do is make sure it stays down long enough for the napalm to work its magic. Once the tyrant is a smoldering pile of ash, it's time to get the hell out of dodge, because where there's one there's probably going to be a second one coming your way soon. Head for the hills like we said earlier, and wait out the end of the world in your mountain solitude. Eventually the 
zombies and mutants will run out of people to eat and most will die of starvation before moving out into the countryside to eat regular animals. In a few years time, the population of mutants will plummet, and while they'll probably stick around as new forms of predatory life on Earth, once the human population rebounds, it'll be easy to exterminate them. If humanity has proven one thing over and over again, it's that when we want a species dead, then by God, we get it dead. Odds are that you've seen the movie Jaws and now every time you get into the water you can't help but feel a bit nervous about what may be lurking unseen around you. You push these fears out of your mind, try to have fun and enjoy the waves, but you can't help yourself from looking around once in a while for a telltale shark fin. Yet it turns out that while you're worried about being attacked by a shark, the sneaky crocodile you were never expecting is already on his way to eat you. Every year about 5 to 6 people die from shark attacks, while humans kill up to 100 million sharks, which basically is the most one-sided war since the French surrender in World War II. Yet crocodiles have been regularly making a meal out of humans at a rate of 200 times greater than sharks. And every year crocodiles and alligators kill an estimated 1,000 people around the world. Most of those fatalities occur in Africa, though many Floridians and Australians have also met their end in the jaws of these prehistoric monsters. And we do mean prehistoric, by the way, as sharks and crocodiles are two of the only known large animal species to be so evolutionarily perfect at their jobs that they haven't evolved much since the age of dinosaurs. Also, while the dinosaurs totally wimped out and died to a measly asteroid the size of New York City, sharks and crocodiles both pretty much shrugged off the global apocalypse and survived to terrify future generations of mammals who would take over the world. Crocodiles are pretty terrifying stuff, and if you've seen our episode Shark vs. Crocodile, who would win, then you already know that saltwater crocs can grow to be much bigger than even a great white shark, reaching up to a whopping 20 feet long and weigh over 2,000 pounds. At those sizes, you're no longer dealing with a crocodile, and we don't care what scientists say here because any reptile that big is a freaking dinosaur. Scientists actually believe that crocodiles never stop growing, and their maximum lifespan is unknown. And it's believed that crocodiles simply continue growing until they've grown so large that they can no longer hunt successfully or simply succumb to disease. As if size wasn't enough, crocodiles also have the greatest bite strength of any animal in the world, with the Nile crocodile clocking in at an astonishing 5,000 pounds per square inch, which is almost 3,000 times more powerful than your measly bite. Saltwater crocodiles, which grow to be the biggest in the world, thankfully have a lower bite strength of around 3,700 pounds per square inch. That's thanks to the massive concentration of jaw muscles crocs have, which is critical for an ambush predator that needs to ensure it can grip prey and never let go. After all, crocs don't have hands. At least not yet. We're sure evolution is working on this though since Mother Nature is apparently dead set on making crocodiles the most terrifying animal in history, so don't be surprised if crocs in the future get opposable thumbs and learn to use guns. So what happens if one of these prehistoric killers decides to make you its next snack? How can you survive a crocodile attack? Well, we have to be honest with you and just say that if you're attacked in the water, things aren't going to go well for you at all. If a crocodile happens to snatch you while you're swimming or just standing in knee-deep water, odds are incredibly low that you're going to escape with your life. If you saw our previous video on Gustav the Killer Crocodile, then you're already aware that this massive beast would regularly snatch fishermen who were only in water up to their knees and drag them away before they could react. In water, crocodiles are incredibly fast, and that's thanks to their massive tail and its powerful muscles. With a single flick, a crocodile can push itself off a sandbar and into deeper water, and given how powerful those jaw muscles are, there's likely little you'd be able to do about it. On land, crocodiles are much slower, though some species and smaller members are capable of surprisingly quick and short sprints. So don't get into the habit of taunting a landbound crocodile, because if you get too close, it can and will snatch you up. The reason why survival is so unlikely if you're attacked in water is simply down to two quirks of crocodilian hunting behavior. This may be surprising to hear, but crocodiles don't actually use those massive jaws to kill, simply to maintain their grip on prey. Crocodiles are actually incapable of chewing, so while a shark will come in for a bite and then shear chunks of flesh off of you, a crocodile will latch on once and then dive deep down. Since a croc can't kill you with its jaws, it instead tries to drown you, 
so as soon as you're attacked the crocodile is going to dive down as deep as it can go and then hold you there. If you do manage to start successfully fighting back though, some crocs will simply decide that better than losing their prey entirely, they'll simply take what they can. This will have the crocodile begin a feeding behavior known as a death roll, and it's basically exactly what it sounds like. The crocodile maintains its grip on the prey and then simply uses its powerful muscles to twist around over and over again, eventually shearing off large chunks of flesh. Crocodiles in danger of losing their prey have been known to engage in this behavior, and we don't have to tell you that this isn't going to end very well for you or your limbs. So the first step in surviving an attack is to simply avoid it altogether. Never go swimming in unfamiliar areas or places that have been marked as unsafe for swimmers. No, ignoring that no swimming sign isn't going to make you look like a cool rebel that society can't keep down, it's just going to turn you into gator bait. Crocodiles and alligators tend to live around the tropical areas of the world, so make sure if you visit or live in those areas, you always stay within designated safe swimming zones. And if you live in Australia, the best way to avoid a crocodile attack is to simply never leave the house. Seriously. Australia is a madhouse of all the world's deadliest animals and insects, and human beings have no business living there. So just stay indoors and upload your consciousness to the matrix, where the wildlife can't get to you. You should always be careful when around the habitat that crocodiles inhabit. This means that swampy or marshy area, and can include lakes, ponds, rivers, estuaries, canals, and even swimming pools, as many Floridians regularly discover. You'll usually find crocs in slow-moving water that has a lot of mud and vegetation, which provides the perfect opportunity for an ambush predator like a crocodile to attack from. However, saltwater crocodiles aren't so named for nothing, and they can be found on ocean beaches and even in open water. If you're canoeing or on a boat, don't assume that you're safe, as crocodiles have been known to overturn boats and even snatch people right off a boat and drag them into the water. Lastly, try and avoid the water near dusk or at night, because this is when crocodiles are most active, though remember they can induce strike during the daytime as well. If you do notice a crocodile, however, or if you perhaps happen to fall into the water with crocodiles in it, try your best to remain calm. Crocodiles are naturally attracted to small animals splashing in water, so you want to swim as quickly but as quietly and calmly as possible back to shore, while causing as little disturbance in the water as you can manage. Staying under the water is even better, as it'll reduce the amount of splash you make as you swim. Don't become panicky as you swim, and do your best to remain calm. Crocodiles, like many predators, are surprisingly wary animals. If prey seems uninjured or unafraid, it often gives many predators second thoughts about launching an attack. After all, they have evolved hunting prey that shows fear, and a prey item that shows a distinct lack of fear is often enough to shake a predator's confidence in launching an attack. This might seem silly, but from the animal's point of view, hunting is an incredibly risky activity. Any stray wound could possibly lead to infection and be fatal. An injury could prevent the animal from hunting, as could damage its teeth and claws. If the animal can't hunt, it'll starve to death and thus predators are surprisingly risk-averse creatures. If you remain calm and collected, there's a chance a prowling crocodile might decide that you're more trouble than you're worth. If you happen to run into a crocodile on land though, once more remain calm and then slowly walk backwards. Again, staying calm might deter an attack, but trying to make a panicked run for it will typically trigger the hunt response in most predators. At that point, you're doing exactly what its prey has always done, and the predator pretty much figures out that you're no different and pose little threat. A confident animal, however, is an animal to be feared, and the crocodile might figure that you have some defenses or a strength it's not aware of. If, however, the crocodile does snap or start to charge you, now it's time to run as fast as you can. You might have heard that you should run in a zigzag pattern because crocodiles can't zigzag very well. And this is true, they really can't, but this also makes you much slower. And if the crocodile is smart enough to stay on a straight trajectory, it'll outrun you. On land, crocodiles can top out at around 10 miles an hour, and you'll be able to outrun that no problem if you simply run straight. If a croc nabs you though, then it's time to fight back and fight hard. Crocodiles are covered in a thick armor plating of hard scales, and underneath that is nothing but thick muscle. Even if you have a knife, you're simply not going to do much damage to a crocodile, and they've been known to resist even high caliber bullets such as those from a 7.62mm rifle. Instead, you're going to want to go for the first obvious vulnerable spot on the crocodile, which are the eyes. 
While a croc's eyes are protected by a nictitating membrane that protects it from water debris, it won't be enough to prevent you from placing a well-aimed eye gouge. If your hands are free and you can reach, the best thing to do is dig your fingers as deep into its eyes as you can manage, though even just kicking at the eyes has been known to get a crocodile to let go. Again, crocodiles as any other predator don't want to risk permanent damage on a single hunt. It's just not worth it, and if the crocodile is afraid of losing its eyesight, it'll more often than not let go. Gouging or kicking at the eyes has saved many lives in the past. If you can't quite reach the eyes though, then concentrate on striking the top of the head, closer to where the jaws begin. If you're a bystander in a crocodile attack, grab a stick or even just use your fists and wail away at the croc's head. Like any animal, crocodiles don't much like having their bell rung. Let's say the worst has come to pass though, and the animal now has you under the water. It's now waiting for you to drown, and your best chance to survive the attack at this point will be to return the favor. Crocodiles have a structure in the back of the mouth just behind the tongue known as the palatal valve. This is a flap of tissue which completely covers their throats when they submerge, so that the animal can still have prey in its jaws and not drown itself by having water pour down its throat. You're going to ignore how terrifying it'll be to reach even deeper into the mouth of the animal and feel for this flap of tissue, then simply strike it or grab at it. Puncturing it or even just moving it out of place will be enough to start to cause water to flow down the croc's throat, and this will automatically trigger the crocodile to let go of you so it doesn't drown. There you have it, our easy to follow steps on how to survive a crocodile attack. Now there's only one thing to do, get out there and test them. Just kidding, seriously, follow our advice and stay out of the water in the wild. If you're longing for the beach, just throw some sand in your tub and splash around in it, because nobody has ever been attacked by a crocodile in their own bathtub. It's late and the house is quiet. You're lying in bed getting to the end of the episode of the infographic show, What Happens When You Die. You think you hear a thud on the lowest floor. You hit pause and listen, nothing. It was probably just a cat doing its late night prowl thing. You hit play, but at that moment, three men burst through your bedroom door, all of them wearing hoodies, their faces hidden by gas masks. No sooner than you drop your phone, the men have your arms and are wrapping duct tape around your mouth. They don't utter a word. They're not here to kill you, they're kidnapping you. As your man handled out of the bedroom, you can just about hear the audio on the phone. See you next time! What you don't know is there are things you should be doing right now. The fact is, some kidnappees are better than others, as in the case of Machine Gun Kelly and the crime that finally brought him down. This was the kidnapping of a wealthy businessman named Charles F. Urschel. Urschel was what you might call a very smart kidnappee. Why was that, you might ask? Well, old man Urschel might have been blindfolded, but he was aware immediately that he had to start taking mental notes. You take one now. If you get kidnapped, get over the fright and start thinking. The man put Urschel in a car and even though the tied up man couldn't see a thing, he knew that he had passed two oil fields that were about 30 minutes apart. How did he know that? You guessed it, he smelled them. He thought he could also hear pumps. All this time, he's been kind of counting the time as best he could. He knew that when they stopped for gas, the time was likely around 3.30 a.m. He later told the FBI that it took about an hour for them to arrive at a house. There was a gate that he heard being opened, and there was a second gate, all noted by Mr. Urschel in what turned out to be a formidable memory. That house wasn't where they kept him though. Urschel was pushed into another car there, and because he felt around the back seat and heard the noise it made, he guessed it was likely a Cadillac or a Buick. He then started counting again and guessed it took about three hours for the next stop, which was a gas station. Old Ursh pricked his ears again and overheard a conversation at the station, which would be very important. He later told the FBI this is what he heard. The crops around here are burned up, although we may make some broom corn. They started driving again and he noticed there was a big rainstorm, like really big, and the men even stopped the car. After that they drove on and on, and when they finally stopped, one of the men made a silly mistake and told Urschel the time. He was then led inside a house and a room that had two beds. His bed was an iron cot. He also heard the voice of a woman in the house, even though his abductors had filled his ears with cotton. Some days later, he was taken to another house 15 minutes away. There he heard barnyard animals and he also heard a man and a woman in another room, but he hadn't heard those voices before. He kept memorizing this. And if you've seen our show on how to be a memory master, you'll know that old Urschel could have easily remembered everything he had experienced so far. 
To cut a long story short, over the course of a few days he heard various animals. He heard a well being pumped, and he knew that the well was northwest of the house. He heard a rope and a pulley working. He also realized that each morning around 9.45 a plane would pass overhead. Ok, so you amateur abductees, if in his shoes might have been feeling sorry for yourself and dreaming of bacon and eggs, but Urschel was decoding his surroundings all the time. An important thing he noticed was that one morning it rained really hard and the plane didn't fly overhead that day. What happened next is the kidnappers got their cash and they took Urschel to a town and released him. He then went to the police. So when he talked to the FBI, what did he tell them of value? Well, he thought that he knew what car he'd been in, he knew the driving times to each destination, he knew what the house might look like and what might surround it, he also knew about weather conditions and importantly, the time he could hear the plane. On its own website, the FBI writes that meteorologists of the United States Weather Bureau of Dallas, Texas was contacted. People there said from what Urschel had said about the rain, he might have been at the place called Paradise in Texas. It made sense given what he said about travel times. This was a place that had recently seen some corn burning. The FBI also wrote that if he was really held at Paradise, then that would make sense too because he would have heard a plane each day around 9.30 am. They looked at the records to see if anyone of importance lived in Paradise and lo and behold, they got a name. We won't go through the whole case again, but we will tell you thanks to Urschel's private snooping, the kidnappers were eventually all arrested. So tip 1 when you get kidnapped, note everything in your mind and keep telling yourself the story. Your kidnapping should read like a really descriptive novel or short story in your head, and you must tell that story over and over again so you don't forget it. Like any good author, Urschel envisioned the room he was in, the animals and the well outside, the plane and the rain. But Urschel, to some extent, was in good hands. Those guys weren't out to hurt him but get the money and leave him alone. They were actually alright with Urschel in terms of how they treated him. With your kidnapping, that might not be the case. Maybe you're just an average person and you or your parents don't have much cash. That won't deter a sadistic killer, he doesn't want to pay off. He wants to look in your eyes as he snips off some of your most treasured body parts. Maybe he just wants to show you some wicked love before he finally decides to strangle you with his mother's stockings. You might also be the victim of a gang that just needs an innocent person for some leverage with the police. This has happened many times. So don't think just because you're an everyday guy you won't ever get kidnapped. Gangsters and serial killers might sometimes have a victim of choice, but some of them embrace equal opportunities when it comes to choosing someone to abduct. First things first, your kidnapper likely doesn't want to kill you right away. But if you kick and scream and fight and make things difficult for your captor, well he or they might just finish you off there and then. If you really can't get away, then accept that and later look for more opportunities. If you can win the fight, fight. By the way, if you get stuffed into the car trunk, you should look for a glow in the dark cord. Hold that when the car is stopped and it will open the trunk. Get out and scream like you never screamed before. Run, victim, run. If there's no cord, you could also try and take the lights out and stick your hands out. Even the more apathetic driver on the road will likely call the cops and report a human waving from a tail light. Of course, there's a big difference from someone who wants to put your removed wiener in a roll and eat it to someone who is merely holding you to thwart the police, but in both cases it might help to create a rapport with your captor. Peter Vronsky, possibly the most important writer today on serial killers, said in his books that there have been cases of killers letting people go. So don't blow your lid and don't start giving your captor a hard time about his body odor. If he is what you'd call a psychosexual killer, you'd want to keep him calm and make him like you. If your captor is just a mean gang member, then remain calm and keep that mind of yours working. If they ask you to do stuff, just do it, don't complain. Any chance you get to make yourself human like a real person, exploit it. The notorious serial killers Ted Bundy and Ed Kemper both let people go. It's very likely that they didn't want to deal with a real person. If you get a chance, humanize yourself, and that goes for any kind of kidnapping experience. Bundy once let a girl go and she said he told her, it's your lucky day little girl, get the hell out of my car. She thought she had seemed too real for him. Kemper once let a person go after he spilled pills in the car and the person commented that her father was on the same meds. That was too real for Kemper, and even he asked about her father's condition. She got to go and didn't end up as decapitated playhead under the big man's bed. You can talk about stuff, incidental stuff, but not your kidnapping or your abductor's intentions, what you learned in psychology class about freaks, or why he's making a big mistake. If you see a story you like, talk about it. If a song comes on the radio, chat about that. Just keep things real. Of course, we are not saying don't try to escape if you see a way out, especially if you're at the mercy of a demented killer, but you should meticulously plan your escape. If you get caught trying, that might be the end of you. If you can get your hands free, great, but first survey where you are. Are the doors locked? When does he sleep? What do you think is outside? Is there anything nearby you can use as a weapon? How fast can he or they run? If you're sure you can get away, then do so, but take precautions. 
But let's say you're not going anywhere for a while. You're waiting, and you know to be calm and create a rapport with your captor. To be brutally honest, if your captor is the kind that is as warped as Ted Bundy, the fact that you're still alive is a miracle. Still, you have to keep calm. Your composure might keep you alive longer, and hey, living with trauma is better than decomposing with the worms. Don't even cry in front of this person. Speak to them kindly if you can, and don't get worked up. Don't lie to him. Don't think you can manipulate him. So don't pretend you're best buddies or you're actually enjoying the experience. He will see through that, and it might just expedite your death. You are not friends, but you're also not a threat or an annoyance. If you're being held by a gang, don't start asking questions about these people. Even if you're being held by a killer, don't ask questions, since knowing stuff about people gives you a lot less chance of them releasing you. The less you know, the better. You can pick up stuff just by observing. Now, for some real practical stuff. Just to stay comfortable, you might try and stretch as much as you can. To keep your mind in a good place, try and meditate and focus on breathing. Do this when there's nothing you can observe. When you're being held for money or for leverage, the longer you're there, the better chance you have of getting away in the end. These people likely don't want to kill you since they want something in exchange for your breathing body. Murder is the last resort, and it can mean a death sentence for them if they're caught. Bear that in mind. Unfortunately, the psychosexual serial killer kidnapped you to live out a fantasy and his intention was always to get rid of you once he had fulfilled his evil desires. If making yourself real didn't work, you might just have to rely on the mercy of God or the cops or the small chance of him just retiring on the spot. We've all been there. One moment you're lying in bed, comfortably wrapped up in a cocoon of blankets, blissfully warm and peaceful. Then the next, your alarm is going off, and before you know it, you're trudging through another cold winter morning to go to work eight hours at a job you hate, trying not to think about the fact that you'll be repeating this routine tomorrow and every day after that, until you die. Or maybe you're stuck in the dog days of summer in the midst of another record-breaking heat wave because global warming is definitely not real, and panting desperately trying to fan yourself and find some relief. Truth is, most people would rather live out lives in a comfortable room temperature world of 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but our reality routinely puts us against bitter elements, extreme cold or extreme heat. If you live somewhere insane like Australia, you get both, plus every animal there can kill you in both hot and cold. But what if you could train yourself to resist the effects of extreme temperatures? We've all read about modern supermen with the power to withstand extreme heat or extreme cold and do things that would seem like they'd kill just about any other person alive. What about you though? The average Joe, could you realistically train your body to survive extreme cold? Wim Hof is a Dutch man known as an extremophile and has earned the nickname The Iceman. In fact, you've probably seen him featured already on our show. Since he was a teenager, Hoff has been routinely subjecting himself to extreme cold, and he's learned not only to love it, but to thrive in it. He's completed several marathons completely barefoot in the Arctic Circle, once spent over an hour swimming under ice, has hiked almost the entire height of Mount Everest wearing only shorts. Yet Hoff is definitely not immune to the effects of the cold. As a matter of fact, during his first attempt to set a record for swimming under ice, he had to be rescued by a diver after his cornea began to freeze. Yes, you heard that correctly, corneas can apparently freeze, and all that did was slow Hoff down. He beat the record the very next day. So then, how does he do these incredible feats? Hoff is well known and often criticized for marketing what he terms the Wim Hof method. While reviews are mixed, the method is fairly simple and consists of engaging in regular meditation and elaborate breathing exercises. According to the method, you first begin with 30 cycles of breathing meant to induce controlled hyperventilation. You inhale, filling the lungs completely, which means starting your breath down in the stomach and slowly expanding your lungs upward. Then you release the breath, but without actually exhaling. Instead, you let the pressure in your lungs force air out before inhaling again. Once you've mastered 30 cycles of controlled hyperventilation, you then focus on controlling your body's response to being deprived of oxygen. You do this by taking deep breaths in, holding it briefly, and then completely expelling all the air out of your lungs. With empty lungs, you then resist the urge to breathe in as long as possible. You might feel yourself drifting into oxygen deprivation panic, but if you hold out long enough, you'll actually eventually receive a boost of oxygen as your liver releases oxygen-rich blood that keeps it stored for emergencies like this. Free divers who swim without oxygen often practice hitting this point and warn that the hardest part is simply keeping your cool and not freaking out. The third step is then to work on your breath retention. After mastering the complete exhalation exercise, you then repeat and when your urges to breathe get incredibly strong, you then take a full deep breath in and hold it for 15 to 20 seconds. Altogether, a complete
complete workout should include three consecutive rounds of all three steps. And this, Hoff claims, will help you master your ability to resist the effects of the cold. But does it work? Well, surprisingly, yes, it does. Scientists have discovered that resisting the effects of cold is more to do with your own mental preparation and willpower, rather than anything biological. Studies on people who have learned to resist the cold show that their core body temperature remains pretty much the same as a regular person's. It's simply their perception of cold that's different. For them, the same cold that sends you scurrying into a pile of blankets is merely a light breeze. Of course, biology does help though, and scientists have also found that individuals who regularly expose themselves to extreme cold actually develop fat deposits known as brown fat. This is the same type of fat you had as a baby, and is largely to thank for your chubby, cute appearance as a newborn. Babies are pretty terrible about keeping body heat in, so the body is able to burn this fat more effectively than regular fat, which helps keep it warm. If you regularly expose yourself to extreme cold, you too can hack your body into believing it needs to generate this type of fat deposits, and in turn, they'll help keep you warm. The trick, though, of course, is to undergo what extremophiles term acclimatization, or the process of gradually increasing exposure to extreme cold. Sorry, but eating a bunch of donuts on the couch isn't going to get you the precious brown fat you need for your underwear-only trip to the North Pole, it's just going to get you regular fat. So, how do you acclimate to extreme cold? First, start with your willpower, because if you don't have much of it, you'll never get used to the cold. You can start, though, by regularly immersing yourself in cold water. In South Korea, there's a community of women free divers who regularly dive for pearls in the freezing ocean, wearing nothing more than a cotton suit. Women of all ages engage in this diving, even women as old as 90. The regular exposure to cold water has toughened up the women to the effects of cold on their bodies, and the good news is that you too can be made as tough as a Korean granny. You can start by taking a shower every morning, which you should already be doing, only now you'll be doing it only with cold water. Start by exposing yourself for 30 seconds at the end of a nice hot shower, then gradually increase the amount of time until eventually you're taking full-on cold showers. You'll be well on your way to hiking through Antarctica in your birthday suit, and you'll save a fortune on your water bill. That's a double win. If you live somewhere with snow, then it's time to kick it up a notch. The Antarctic explorer H.R. Bowers was well known for stripping completely naked every morning and dumping buckets of cold water and slush over himself. You, however, can start with a Wim Hof technique often called snow laying, and you guessed it, it's as simple as laying on snow while wearing as little as possible. Just like the shower, regularly increase the amount of time you spend exposed to the snow. If you're not somewhere snowbound though, you can replicate this by filling a tub full of ice and sliding in. The longer you can stay in, the closer you'll be to calling yourself a proper ice man. Pretty soon you'll be toasting cokes with polar bears wearing nothing but sandals, though we should warn you that sudden exposure to extreme cold does come at a risk of a heart attack, so make sure you're in decent health before you attempt any of this and consult a doctor. Also, Coca-Cola lies and polar bears will 100% eat you on sight. Though luckily for you, they'll all be dead from global warming soon. We've now conquered one half the planet wearing nothing but ducktails themed boxers and a smile. But what about heat? For heating, we're turning to one of our own wilderness survival gurus who's had regular experience in desert environments with temperatures well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or whatever people who never landed on the moon measure it with. Just kidding. We really all should be using a single measuring system, and it's kind of silly we don't. Anyways. Tolerating heat is also a mental affair, though unlike the cold, the body actually comes first. In extreme temperatures, the body attempts to cool itself by sweating profusely, the water acting as a radiating fluid which more easily enables heat to transfer from your body to the ambient air. That little trick, by the way, is what made humans the top species on Earth. While other animals were killing prey with sharp claws and fangs, we simply ran our prey to death and typically did so during the hottest times of the day when animals who can't sweat or sweat very poorly were most vulnerable to dying of overheating. Meanwhile, our awesome sweat glands pumped away the entire time, keeping us from dying as we chased our prey for miles at a time. But the real reason why our ancient ancestors didn't keel over dead from the heat, and so many modern suburbia Spartan challenge tryouts do, has to do with water. We investigated this issue carefully and discovered that top scientists have learned that sweat consists mainly of water. So if you aren't properly hydrated, your body isn't going to have much moisture to work with and help vent deadly heat being generated within your body. Of course, your body needs water for pretty much anything it does though, so the real trick of surviving extreme heat is to simply stay hydrated 
Incredibly, you can lose as much as a liter of water per hour in a hot environment if engaged in strenuous activity, and considering that most doctors recommend you drink 1.5 to 2 liters of water every day during normal activity, you can quickly see what the problem is. The trick is going to be to keep consuming water during your time in the heat. With our desert guru recommending you drink at least 8 liters of water a day the entire time you're in extreme heat. You'll want to consume this water at a moderate pace, however, as extreme heat can make the stomach quite sensitive, and drinking too much water at once could actually lead you to vomiting. And unless you enjoy eating vomit, you're going to be losing out on precious liters of water. Instead, just pace yourself as you drink, taking frequent sips. If you're out in extreme heat for a long time, though, then water alone will eventually not be enough, and you'll need to replace precious minerals such as potassium. Due to sugars and other ingredients your body doesn't need unless under extreme stress, Sports drinks are terrible to drink if you're just sitting on the couch all day doing nothing more than yelling at informative YouTube shows in the comments section. Adding sports drinks to your hydration routine in extreme heat, though, will keep you in tip-top shape. And as long as you protect your exposed skin from the sun, there's really no limit to how long you can tolerate even scorching temperatures. Maintaining hydration is key, though. Overhydrating can also be deadly and lead to a condition known as water intoxication. Don't worry, though. That's pretty rare and your body will pretty readily warn you of this condition. Though, if you're truly in the middle of record-setting heat, there's little risk of this happening. You are an aging archaeologist, and let's face it, your life may have been filled with adventure, but you've definitely seen better days. Also, some kid just showed up in your life claiming he's yours, and there's rumors he's there to take over your daring adventures while you sit out in retirement. Only problem is that this kid has the world's most punchable face, and nobody really likes him, or the idea of him taking over your iconic hat and bullwhip. As a matter of fact, everybody hates that idea. But that doesn't matter right now because you've been taken hostage by a group of Soviet spies, and in a classic case of wrong place, wrong time, you're now sitting smack dab in the middle of a nuclear test area. Suddenly, you see a flash in the distance, and you know you've got seconds to figure out how to survive a nuclear explosion. Whether you really are a daring archaeologist stuck in the wrong place at the wrong time, or just an average Joe going about your life when suddenly Armageddon strikes, worries about how to survive nuclear explosions have been increasing as the world appears to be swinging back into a new Cold War. Only this time it's between three major powers, not just two. But how in the world do you really survive a nuclear explosion, and is survival even realistic? The good news is it is totally possible to survive a nuclear explosion. The bad news is that for most folks the explosion isn't what poses the greatest danger, it's the radioactive fallout. But let's take this step by step and figure out how to save your life in the case of nuclear Armageddon. The first key to figuring out your odds of survival is one critical question. Was the detonation an air burst or a ground burst? It may seem like the height at which the nuclear weapon explodes is largely a moot point. Nukes, after all, are the most devastating weapons ever created. But the truth is that the difference between a nuke blowing up at street level or just a few hundred or thousand feet above street level can make all the difference. Cities tend to be lousy with buildings, and even when dealing with the titanic forces of a nuclear explosion, buildings can do a lot to seriously deflate the explosive potential of a nuke. Row after row of densely packed apartment complexes and office buildings can all serve to block the explosive power of the nuke, limiting its destructive potential by as much as 50%. The fireball radius where material is instantly disintegrated can be as much as 25% smaller, but the radius where the overpressure causes buildings to collapse is much, much smaller compared to an airburst. Airbursts are designed for maximum destruction, with the weapon detonating just a few thousand feet above the target. This allows for the explosive radius to extend much further, as it's not being blocked by buildings and other terrain obstacles. Deciding which is best for your survival is a bit of a Sophie's choice, though, as airburst weapons may have a much larger explosive radius, but actually causes very minimal fallout. By comparison, groundburst detonations have smaller explosive radius, but contribute an order of magnitude more to radioactive fallout. The only reason Japanese citizens continue to be able to live in the cities of Nagasaki and Hiroshima is because the United States opted for an airburst over the target. Had the bombs been allowed to detonate on impact as some had wanted, those two cities would remain as uninhabitable as Chernobyl is to this day. The reason for the disparity in fallout is because an airburst tends to actually discharge most of the radioactive products into the uppermost layers of the atmosphere and into space, while a ground burst instantly irradiates millions of tons of soil and debris which is vaporized and sucked up into the atmosphere only to rain back down like hell's version of snow. 
Your survival is thus going to depend on which type of detonation took place and where you are when the attack happens. A modern weapon such as China's Dongfeng 5 will have a yield of 5 megatons, creating a fireball radius of about 2.5 miles or 3 to 4 kilometers. Anything in this area has zero chance of survival unless deep underground, as the blast is so intense here that it instantly vaporizes all material. Past the fireball area, most buildings will be completely destroyed going out to a further 7.5 mile radius, as overpressure causes instant collapse of all but the sturdiest buildings. If you're caught out in the open in this area, it'll be like getting Fusro Dodd by an entire army of Dragonborn, so enjoy your very sudden and very short life as a bird before you get squashed into the nearest brick wall. Out to about 15 and a half miles, there will be light building collapse, with most buildings surviving if not completely intact. If you happen to be caught out in the open though, you'll instantly suffer third degree burns across any exposed areas of your body, and your clothes will likely either melt to your body or burst into flames. Massive fires will soon start and spread very quickly, further complicating survival. At 21 and a half miles from the blast zone, damage caused to buildings will be light, with mostly shattered glass and some roof collapse. This is the most survivable zone to be in, so if you're going to be anywhere when Sky Knight takes over the world, this is where you want to be. So how do you survive a nuclear blast? First, you should be aware that because light travels faster than sound, you're going to see a nuclear explosion before you hear or feel it. If you happen to be within a few miles of the blast and are unlucky enough to be staring in its direction, your retinas will be seared like tuna steaks, and it'll be the last thing you don't see. If you're further out and a blast happens, you may be very tempted to immediately rush to a window and be a total looky-loo, which would be a very bad idea. The overpressure wave will be rapidly moving toward your direction, and a few seconds after the blast, it's going to wash over you. If you're on the other side of a pane of glass or standing outside, you'll be showered in debris and shattered glass. You might be thinking about the old Cold War era civilian protection films from the US, like the famous duck and cover film showing a turtle teaching school kids how to survive a nuke. Well, it may be cheesy and corny, but the truth is that ducking and covering is the best way to survive a nuke, given that you're actually in a survivable zone. Ducking low to the ground will help you avoid flying debris if you're caught out in the open, and covering yourself with anything available will help protect against debris and the thermal flash which will cook your flesh like barbecue. Finding a sturdy desk to hide under is your best go-to if you're indoors, as the greatest danger in the survivable blast zone is building collapse. In essence, the same strategies to survive a major earthquake come into play with nuclear weapons. Find something sturdy and get underneath it. If you're caught out in the open, cover your head and neck with your hands and bury your face in the dirt. Ideally, you want to lay with your feet toward the blast because your head is more important for survival than your feet. The real trick to surviving a nuclear attack, though, is not the initial blast, but rather the immediate aftermath. Depending on the type of attack, ground versus airburst, you'll have anywhere between 5 and 30 minutes before fallout starts. Well, falling out of the sky all around you. These fission byproducts are extremely dangerous and will ruin your day faster than telling Shaggy his meme is dead. Now you might be tempted to run for it immediately after the blast subsides. Just hop in the car and outdrive the nuclear fallout. Disturbingly, in some polls, a great deal of Americans had that same idea. The problem is that the roads are either going to be destroyed or choked with debris or filled with thousands of people who all had the same idea you did. Also, atmospheric winds can move much faster than a car, giving you no chance of outrunning them if you're traveling in the same direction. The best survival strategy is the same one the US government has been preaching for decades, shelter in place. You want to find a sturdy shelter and get inside as soon as possible. Something underground is ideal, but if your building doesn't have a basement, then simply try to put as much distance and barriers between yourself and the outside world as possible. Try to keep in mind the basic safety principle behind nuclear power, time, distance, and shielding. As you increase either of those factors, you increase your odds of survival. Gathering in the core of a large building will offer great protection from fallout, adding both distance and shielding. Surprisingly, if you live in a particularly tall building, the higher up you go, the better your odds of surviving the fallout. If, of course, your building doesn't have a basement. This only works on buildings higher than six stories, though, as they rise above the prevailing height of the ground winds, pushing atomized radioactive debris around. Once you've accomplished distance and shielding, the next step is time. You want to wait between 12 and 24 hours, but the longer you wait, the better. That's because the most dangerous radioactive isotopes have a very short half-life and will quickly decay. So the longer you're able to shelter in place, the better. Once it's time to move out, though, you want to protect yourself from the greatest danger of a post-nuclear attack, ingestion of radioactive fallout. This low-level fallout doesn't pose any real threat to your health unless it is accidentally ingested, so try and fashion some protective face masks to 
filter out the air you breathe. Even just wetting a t-shirt and tying around your nose and mouth can help keep this dangerous breathable fallout from getting into your body. Your best bet though is to avoid traveling altogether, adding further time to your safety equation. Shelter in place for as long as you can, which means that you need to be prepared for an emergency so you're able to do so. The US government recommends having at least a few days worth of food and water. Water, as you likely know, is far more important than food. While you can survive around a month without food, you can only go three days without drinking water. So keep an emergency stash on hand, remembering that the average human needs one gallon of water per day. Non-perishable foods can help you weather the immediate aftermath of a nuclear attack. Things like canned goods, dehydrated foods, and even pickled items can last a long time and make for great emergency rations. You can easily buy military MREs or a meal ready to eat online, and two of those contain more than enough calories to keep you going for a day. Though these specialized meals are so energy rich that a single one is enough for the average adult human. Next, the US government recommends that you have a way of keeping informed in the aftermath of a nuclear attack. The EMP blast will likely destroy any surviving cell or internet infrastructure though. You might be surprised to learn that the internet is humanity's most resilient communications network given the fact that it's so widely dispersed. However, huddling in your shelter still within the city limits of a nuclear attack, you'll be far better served with a satellite or shortwave radio. It will be important to be able to get further instructions from your local government authorities who will be coordinating a rescue and relief effort. Certain conditions like rainstorms can actually make the fallout effect more dangerous, so even just having basic access to weather forecasts can be a lifesaver. Like many things in life, surviving a nuclear attack is largely a matter of timing and location. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, there's little chance of survival for you. But even as destructive as the fearsome weapons are, the fact is that most people would survive a nuclear attack on their city. In a city like Los Angeles, for instance, a nuclear attack could kill 1.5 million out of a population of 4 million. But if your city is less densely packed, your odds of survival are much greater. Just whatever you do, don't think you can survive a nuclear explosion inside a refrigerator. Statistics prove that your home is going to be invaded, and that you and everyone you love most will be brutally murdered. Well, that's if you live for about a thousand years, given that of the 2.5 million burglaries in the US every year, only 1.6 or so million are home invasions. With a current population of 331.5 million, you've got some really long odds to actually end up the victim of a home invasion. However, it can still happen to you, and it doesn't hurt to be prepared. The first rule for surviving a home invasion is to make yourself a hard target. In the world of security, hard targets are targets that have taken measures to either protect themselves or make an attempt at attacking them so difficult or time-consuming that the odds of a successful attack are dramatically lowered. Common measures for hardening a target include security patrols, alarms and a quick reaction force, and physical barriers. Even just the appearance of being a hard target can often be enough to deter an attack in the first place. For home invasions, this means taking steps to make your home a hard target for would-be burglars. The first step can be as simple as leaving a light on in one of the public areas of the home, even while everyone else is asleep or the home is empty. Even better if you accompany that light with a television or radio, anything to give the illusion that someone is not only home but awake and aware. The vast majority of home invasions aren't looking to actually hurt anyone, and if burglars were aware someone was home, they would more than likely simply choose a different target. Should go without saying, but having strong locks is the key to deterring a home invasion. Most burglars use the front door when breaking into a home, and this means your first line of defense against an invader is a sturdy front door with an equally sturdy lock. You can even purchase tools such as doorstops that slide in from your side of the door and make it virtually impossible to open without tearing the entire thing off its hinges. Security lighting is also a vital home security tool, as burglars are far less likely to strike at a well-illuminated home where they might easily be spotted by passers-by. There are plenty of options for security lighting available which include solar cells to make them energy efficient, and motion sensors which activate bright lighting the moment they detect movement. Many modern home security systems even include active recording for later prosecution, and having your bright outside lights suddenly flare on can be a good warning to you inside the house that a prowler or Bigfoot is lurking outside. Only half of US homes have security systems, and with 83% of burglars checking for a security system before striking, this leaves unalarmed homes with a 300% greater chance of being broken into. Security systems often not only include loud alarms to deter an intruder and alert you of a penetration, but also have a feature that automatically dispatches either a security patrol or contacts police for a fast response. But having an alarm isn't good enough. The entire point is to make it clear that the home is alarmed. 
That's why most alarm services come with a large sticker or sign that can be posted in the yard, which prominently display the alarm company's logo and warns would-be intruders and Bigfoot that your home is alarmed. Once more, even the appearance of security can be a huge deterrent, so if you can't afford an alarm system, maybe just get yourself an alarm company's sign and stick it in your front yard. Dogs are great deterrents as well, even though they don't have to be beefed up cujos to keep you safe. Even a small yapping chihuahua can serve as a deterrent, making loud noises that can bring unwanted attention to an intruder. Of course, having a large protective dog can be a visual deterrent as well. But what if intruders get inside the house? Well, now it's time to think fast and be prepared. First, you have a plan. You and your family should know exactly what you're going to do if someone breaks into your home, so the plan can be initiated immediately and without the need for everyone to congregate and figure out what to do next. If possible, a safe room should be established in the house. This would be a room that's very difficult and time-consuming to break into, and that has some way of contacting the authorities. This is your fort, where you'll wait out the home invasion until police arrive. Take the advice of professionals, and no matter how many Chuck Norris movies you've recently seen or how big your gun collection is, get your ass in your safe room and stay there. Trying to repel home invaders can not only get you killed, but could actually land you in jail if you open fire and kill or severely injure one of the burglars. In some states, if a burglar isn't posing a direct threat to your life, shooting one just for breaking into your home can end up with you in prison. If you can avoid a fight, do it and just hop into your safe room. Valuables can be replaced, your life can't. However, if your home doesn't have a good safe room available, you need to amend your plan. The goal, once more, is to get to safety, so exits via windows or back doors should be well rehearsed. Children can be taught to leave their rooms via their bedroom windows as long as there's a safe way to do so. Exiting via a front or back door can be risky, and this is likely how the invader got into your home in the first place. The last thing you want is to run full tilt into your home invader. Keep in mind, most burglars don't want to add murder to their potential charges. Thus, fleeing is always the safest option. If you're surprised, however, and have no way to flee, cooperation is the next best option. Vast majority of burglars simply want to make a quick score and get out before a neighbor calls the cops, so giving up a few material goods and cash is infinitely better choice than getting killed. If, however, you have the means to defend yourself or your state allows you the full use of force and defense of your home, fighting back can also be an option, but it should be an option of last resort. Again, a few material goods isn't worth getting killed or killing over. When it comes to a home defense arsenal, there's a variety of choices and most of them are bad. For tips, we turn to our resident challenge expert, who happens to have almost a full decade of close quarters battle experience under his belt. First, you shouldn't assume that you'll be the single line of defense against a home invasion. A variety of things could take you out of the fight before it even begins, or you might not even be home when an invasion occurs. For these reasons, everyone in your household should be taught how to use a firearm properly, and yes, that even includes children. In fact, proper firearm training for children is one of the best ways to prevent an accidental death or injury. A gun is a tool, and if children growing up since the 1700s hunting with firearms as young as six, today's children are no worse suited for learning how to respect and even use a weapon. What firearm you choose, however, is also critical. A 9mm pistol is an excellent home defense tool, as it is incredibly easy to operate and learn how to use. It's also very easy for smaller or weaker members of the family to use effectively, and it doesn't have the kick of, say, a 45. That also means it doesn't have the stopping power of a 45, but let's be honest, you're not looking to take out a squad of enemy infantry wearing body armor. The vast majority of home invaders aren't looking to get into a shootout. A 9mm is simple, reliable, and a great home defense choice for your entire family. If you're looking to scale things up, don't fall into the easy pitfall of macho gun porn nonsense. Sure, a huge rifle can make you feel like a Billy Badass, but oftentimes it can be terrible choices for home defense. In fact, our CQB expert doesn't even have a recommended rifle at all. A hunting rifle is simply not suited for close quarters and has an atrocious rate of fire, plus can be difficult to use effectively if wounded or by smaller members of the family. A civilian model assault rifle such as an M4 is an excellent close quarters battle tool, but it comes with its own problems. First, a 5.56 is going to punch through one or more of the walls in your home which means you're now putting your family's life at risk every time you take a shot. You can't predict the geometry of a firefight, 
and if you end up forced to shoot in the wrong direction, it could be you and not an invader putting a bullet in one of your family members. Second, most home invasions take place at night, so you should always assume the worst case scenario, a confrontation at night when you're likely groggy or tired and in very low light conditions. An assault rifle needs some expert marksmanship to be effective in these conditions, and while you may be hitting bullseyes at the range, it's a whole different story when you're scared for your life and just got woken up from a deep sleep at 3 am. That's why our resident expert recommends a good old fashioned shotgun. Shotguns are incredibly easy to operate, but best of all, excellent accuracy is not mandatory in order to drop a perp dead or at least make them seriously reconsider breaking into your house. Any member of the family can use a shotgun with great effectiveness, even though, yes, they do pack quite a kick that can make it difficult for weaker or smaller members of the family to operate. But one shot is often enough with a shotgun anyway, while an assault rifle, as many US troops found out overseas, can take multiple hits to ensure a kill. A shotgun's wide dispersal also makes it easier to get hits on target under less than ideal conditions, such as you being sleep deprived and scared for your life at 2 am in the near pitch black. A shotgun is also less likely to penetrate through a wall and place your family at risk from wayward shots. Even if penetration does occur, most of the pellets will be stopped or deflected with the remaining having large amounts of their kinetic energy sapped. Resulting wounds would be much more survivable than taking a 5.56 or a 7.62 in the gut, both rounds that can easily penetrate even concrete cover. Fighting should be a last resort, but if you have to fight, it's important to have the right tool for the job. Owning your very own AR-15 or M4 can make you feel like a pretty cool guy, but trying to use one in tight quarters will quickly show you why our military and police spend countless hours training on CQB courses. Plus, with every trigger pull, you run the risk of putting your family or even a neighbor at serious risk. While you're out shopping for a new home defense shotgun, make sure you get yourself a good old-fashioned pump action. Semi-autos may sport a better rate of fire, but they're well known to be finicky and prone to interruptions. Pump action shotguns have been defending American homes for two centuries and will likely continue to do so for centuries to come. January 3, 1943. During an air raid, B-17 bombers darkened the skies over Nazi-occupied Saint-Nazaire, France. An attack from German anti-aircraft artillery rips through a gun turret on one of the planes. Thankfully, the gunner, U.S. Army Air Force Staff Sergeant Alan McGee, is unharmed, but his parachute has been shredded. Suddenly, more flak blows off part of the plane's right wing, setting the bomber aflame and sending it into a deadly tailspin. What happens next is miraculous. McGee blacks out and is thrown clear of the plane. He falls over 4 miles, some 22,000 feet, and lives. He crashes through the glass roof of a train station, suffering severe injuries. However, German doctors nurse him back to health, and McGee spends most of the rest of World War II as a POW. Interestingly, Sergeant McGee isn't the only person to have survived falling out of an airplane. On January 26, 1972, Vesna Vulovich, a flight attendant, was the sole survivor after a bomb exploded aboard the JAT Yugoslav Airlines flight JU-367. She fell some 33,330 feet, earning a spot in the Guinness World Records for surviving the highest fall without a parachute. Also, who can forget brave Yuliana Kopka, whom we profiled in our episode she fell 10,000 feet and survived 11 days in the Amazon rainforest. Yuliana survived an incredible two-mile fall and then a trek through the jungle while severely injured. We don't even think we could survive a two-mile jog, let alone a fall. How common is it to survive falling out of an airplane, though? Is there anything you could do to improve your chances of surviving? The median lethal dose for falls is four stories, or about 48 feet. This means that 50% of people who fall from four stories will sustain fatal injuries. It only gets worse as height increases. At seven stories or 84 feet, the chance of survival are one in 10. So unfortunately, the chances of survival in falling out of an airplane are pretty slim. No official statistics exist, however, according According to various aviation accident websites, there are less than 50 known cases of survival when falling from a plane. That would include falling out of an airplane without a parachute like Sergeant McGee, or falling attached to airplane debris like Vulovich or Kepka. If you're going to survive the plummet, it's better to fall from the cruising altitude of a commercial flight, which is typically around 35,000 feet, rather than a shorter distance of 1,500 feet. That sounds a little crazy, but hear us out. Falling from around 1,500 feet, or a distance just a little taller than the Empire State Building, means you'll reach your terminal velocity before you hit the ground. As gravity pulls you toward Earth, you fall faster. However, at the same time, your drag increases. When downward force equals upward resistance, acceleration 
station stops, and you'll reach the fastest speed you'll descend at, or your terminal velocity. For average adult humans, this is around 120 to 130 miles per hour, so the impact speed is the same whether you fall from 35,000 feet versus 1,500. What's different is time. 1,500 feet is going to only give you approximately 10 to 12 seconds of free fall before impact while falling from 35,000 feet or over 6.6 .6 miles will give you about 3 minutes of free fall before you potentially become a pancake. Actually, before and as you fall out of the plane, if possible, grab a hold of plane debris. Becoming a wreckage rider, a term coined by Jim Hamilton, creator of the Free Fall Research website, a database cataloging known free falls, can help you survive the plunge by adding some protection and even somewhat cushioning your fall. Also, the larger surface area of the debris increases air drag, slowing your descent. Flight attendant Vulovich fell jammed between her seat, a catering cart, and the body of another crew member, and a section of the airplane. Though she was severely injured, being enclosed in debris helped to shield her from the worst of the impact. Based on statistics from plausible freefall incidents, you're more likely to survive if you're attached to debris than a freefall solo. While freefalling from 35,000 feet, you have enough time to possibly make some very quick decisions on how to mitigate your impact. However, there are drawbacks from falling from such a high distance. At higher altitudes, it's extremely cold. The temperature at 35,000 feet is often in excess of negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit. A reaction to the cold or rapid change in temperature as you drop is possible. However, there are no reports detailing how individuals have been affected. Frankly, temperature is the least of your worries. At 35,000 feet, oxygen is thin. It's likely that you'll experience hypoxia and spend roughly the first minute of your fall unconscious. You might stay unconscious for the duration of your fall and be spared the last few terrifying moments of your life, but most likely you'll come to once you've fallen around 2 miles. Of course, how fast you're falling and how quickly you regain consciousness are tied to several variables that we cannot account for, such as air currents, the trajectory at which you leave the plane, your mass and personal blood oxygen saturation level. Once you awaken, you'll have around 2 minutes left to exit execute any strategies for survival. The first thing you want to do is calm down. We get it, it's extremely hard to adopt a zen-like attitude when death is most likely imminent, but take a deep breath and try anyway. Although you've regained consciousness, your body is still feeling the effects of hypoxia. If you panic, it's really easy to hyperventilate. Slip back into a blackout and lose valuable freefall seconds you could be using to mitigate your injury or fatality. You need all your wits about you to focus on planning your landing. You cannot do that if you're freaking out. Great, now that you've taken a split second and gotten a hold of yourself, the next thing you want to do is to attempt to slow your fall and gain a few extra seconds of precious freefall time. A good position to create wind resistance is the classic skydiver's pose called the box. To assume, flip onto your stomach and arch your back, lifting your head and shoulders slightly. Spread your arms and legs equal distance. Bend your arms at the elbow. Also, bend your knees about a 45 degree angle, leaving your lower legs slightly extended into the wind. Not only will this position help to slow your descent a little, in skydiving it's considered a neutral, stable freefall position from which other maneuvers are performed. From the box, you can move into the slowdown position. Lower your head, turning it to one side, straighten your arms, and further extend your legs, spreading out into an X. Flatten your torso, point your feet and toes as much as possible, and tense your muscles, deliberately pushing against the air. This position provides the greatest resistance possible. If you start to wobble or flip, return to the skydiver's box posture before trying the slow fall position again. Now, take a quick look around. It's unlikely, but you may have a second chance at grabbing a hold of some plane debris to cushion your fall. If suitable wreckage is falling nearby, you may want to try to angle yourself toward it so you can grab on. Skydivers form formations before deploying their parachute, so it's possible to steer toward and grab a hold of objects while falling. However, maneuvering during skydiving does take practice, and generally, it's not something you do on your first jump. Remember, time is at a premium, and it's better to get yourself in the best position possible for impact rather than crash land in a poor position because you were chasing debris. Whether maneuvering to reach debris or aiming for a landing spot, here are some basic moves for steering. From the box position to turn yourself left, deflect more air off your right arm than your left by moving your left arm down and your right arm up in equal proportion. Imagine an airplane banking. That's exactly what you're doing. To turn right, do the reverse, right arm down, left arm up. You'll continue to turn according to your arm actions until you resume the neutral box position. Another common skydiving move is tracking or moving horizontally while freefalling. For a basic side tracking stance, from the box position straighten your arms and legs. Bring your arms to your side and rotate them out slightly so your palms are facing downward. 
flatten your back, lower your head, and curl your body in just a little. Frankly, you're not going to have much time to think about proper skydiving form, so do whatever movement that seems to alter the direction of the drag force acting on your body to try to produce the desired motion to guide yourself. Your next step is to look down for a suitable landing area. It's best if you can land on or in anything that offers give, such as a tree canopy, haystack, or a snowdrift. Swampland or grass are better than plain ground. Even power lines are preferable to the ground because they break your fall. Any ground cover that spreads your impact over a longer period or absorbs it in stages could mean the difference between a couple of broken bones and severe trauma to internal organs. Try not to land in water. It can be as dangerous as landing on concrete. Firstly, you have no way of determining depth. Even when the water is deep enough for landing, once you break the surface of the water, your velocity drops almost instantaneously to zero, exerting strong g-forces on your body. If you must land in water, try to minimize impact by assuming postures that cause a minimum surface area of your body to bear the brunt of the force. That would be a pencil dive position. Jump feet first with your arms held slightly to your sides and your feet pressed together and pointed downward. You're striving to enter the water in a straight vertical line. Also, clench your muscles, especially your butt muscles, unless you want a painful and damaging forced enema. Among experienced cliff divers, injuries such as broken bones, spinal compression, and concussions occur. Even if you survive the dive into the water with only a few broken bones, you may be stunned and slow to respond. Watch out, it's easy to ingest water and possibly drown. To minimize body impact on landing, many researchers think the best posture to assume is one similar to a parachute landing fall. That means landing on the balls of your feet with the legs together and your knees a little bent. Immediately allow your body to crumple slightly backwards and into a horizontal position while turning toward one side of your body as determined by dominant directional speed. Basically, you're attempting to distribute the force of the landing step by step up your torso along five points of body contact with the ground feet, calf, thigh, hip or buttock, and the side of the back. Also, you should tuck your chin and wrap your arms around your head for protection as you land. Furthermore, relax your body as much as possible. This allows you to use your body's natural elasticity to help slow things down over a greater unit of time. Ultimately, you're sacrificing the long bones in your legs, which can absorb a large amount of impact energy before fracturing, for the good of your torso. No matter how you land, of course, you want to try to protect your head and neck as much as possible. Landing head first almost certainly guarantees death. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first thousand people to sign up using the link in the description will get their first two months free. A tornado is a rapidly rotating column of air that is in contact with both the surface of the earth and the stormy clouds above. This fierce windstorm is often referred to as a whirlwind or a twister. Most tornadoes are found in the Great Plains of the central United States because it's an ideal environment for the formation of severe thunderstorms. In this area, known as Tornado Alley, storms are caused when dry, cold air moving south from Canada meets warm, moist air traveling north from the Gulf of Mexico. Tornadoes are hugely destructive forces of nature. If you find yourself face to face with one, quick thinking is needed. In this episode of the Infographics Show, we'll attempt to work out what is the safest place during a tornado. On August 3rd of this year, 12-year-old Haley and her 10-year-old brother Hunter Olishak were among 40 people who huddled in the basement of their grandparents' home near Margaret Bruce Beach while an F4 tornado tore across the property on its way to Lake Manitoba. The power of a tornado is categorized on the Fujita Tornado Intensity Scale, or F scale, with ratings of F1 to F5, 5 being the most destructive. The F4 that these two children survived is considered devastating, with winds between 207 and 260 miles per hour. The tornado that hit the Alonsa area killed one man, 77-year-old Jack Furry, and destroyed several homes, trailers, vehicles, and farm structures. It also destroyed an outbuilding on the Olishak property. CNBC News reported that both Hunter and Haley saw and heard the twister as it chewed its way across the RM area of Alonsa. They said that they spent their time in the basement of their home, huddled under a mattress placed there by their dad just in case a tree fell on the house, Hunter said. So in this case, it looks like a mattress acted as a good safety cover for young Haley and Hunter. What other recommendations are out there if you find yourself in the heart of a tornado? Oklahoma is located in Tornado Alley, and so there's no better place to seek advice than from the website of the Oklahoma Emergency Medical Services Authority, or EMSA. Here's the advice they give on the safest place
places to be during a tornado. In terms of how much time you have to play with, if a tornado has been spotted by the weather radar, you need to seek shelter immediately. A basement or storm shelter underground is by far the safest place to be, but you may not have time to reach one, in which case you'll need to improvise and find the safest place possible. If you're at home when the storm hits, here's the advice. 1. If you have a cellar, storm shelter, safe room, or basement available, go immediately to that area. If none of these options are available to you, then you should get to the lowest level of your home. 2. Find the nearest windowless interior room, such as a bathroom, closet, or inner hallway. 3. Stay as far away from windows as possible. They'll shatter when the storm hits. 4. Go to the center of the room. Corners tend to attract debris. 5. Get under a sturdy piece of furniture, heavy table or desk, or hold onto it, or a mattress if one is available. 6. And protect your head and neck with a blanket if possible. That's the advice if you live in a bricks and mortar house. But what if you live in a mobile home? Mobile homes are particularly vulnerable to tornadoes. Even if they've been anchored down, they can still be easily overturned by the strong swirling winds. If you're in a mobile home when a tornado is approaching, evacuate the home immediately. 1. If possible, find the nearest building with a strong foundation and take shelter there. 2. If a shelter is not available, lie in a ditch or low-lying area a safe distance away from the mobile home. 3. Use your arms to protect your head and neck. 4. Stay alert to the potential for flooding. If you're at work or school, 1. Go to the basement or an inside hallway at the lowest level. 2. Avoid places with wide-span roofs, such as auditoriums, cafeterias, gymnasiums, large hallways, or shopping malls. 3. Get under a sturdy piece of furniture such as a desk or a heavy table. 4. Use your arms to protect your head and neck. If you're in a vehicle, never try to outrun a tornado. Tornadoes can change direction quickly, and a car is no match for the strong tornado gusts and can be tossed through the air. Get out of the vehicle immediately and take shelter in a nearby building. And if there's no time to take shelter, then use the same advice when stranded outside. Lie in a ditch or low-lying area. Use your arms to protect your head and neck and stay alert to the potential for flooding. Those are a few suggestions on how to protect yourself if a tornado hits. But it's also sensible to be as prepared as you can. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, the best way to stay safe during a tornado is to have the following items on hand fresh batteries, and a battery-operated TV, radio, or internet-enabled device to listen to the latest emergency weather information, a tornado emergency plan, including access to a safe shelter for yourself and for people with special needs, an emergency kit including water, non-perishable food, and medication, and a list of important information, including telephone numbers, and of course, it's always sensible to be aware of the weather conditions, as well as keeping an eye on the sky. If you know thunderstorms are expected, stay tuned to a local radio radio and TV station. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency, or NOAA, NOAA, there is no guaranteed safety during a tornado. Even the possibility of a tornado must be taken seriously. In 2016, the tornado season claimed the lives of 18 individuals and injured another 325. 78% of those victims were in a mobile home or trailer park at the time of the tornado. These storms caused an estimated $183 million in property damage. Although the most violent tornadoes can level and blow away almost any house and those within it, extremely violent F5 tornadoes are very rare, and most tornadoes are much weaker. Do you know what to do in case of a massive emergency? Maybe not for a tornado, but how about for an earthquake or a flood? If not, you should consider taking a class with a retired hired U.S. Navy military police officer called Basic Disaster Prep, developing a home preparedness plan. You can learn this and many more things by joining Skillshare. Study things that will help you out with your day-to-day -day life, or maybe improve skills that will get you better job opportunities. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in leadership, photography, productivity, and more. Premium membership will get you unlimited access to topics that will improve your skills and your life. Join the millions of other people who are using Skillshare and get two months for free. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash infographics33 or click the link in the description and start learning today. Do you live in Tornado Alley and maybe you've seen one of these destructive forces of nature in action? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to watch our other video called This Man Spent 43 Years in Isolation. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.